Councilman Dehovic is calling in by phone. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Councilman Campbell? Here. Councilman Dehovic? Councilman Mizetich? Present. Okay, before we go forward, I want to make sure we have Councilman Dehovic uh, online. Councilman Dehovic? Okay, I, I want to just hold off uh, on the roll call until we get him online. Okay, very good. Very well. So we'll just take a, just a little brief break here for a minute, and then we can, once he gets online, we'll get things Got going. anything you want to talk about? Oh, let's see. Community uh, and Not yet. Okay. I will be informed uh, soon when he will be online. So at this point, uh, Mayor Pro Tem, Brooks, would you like to lead us in the Pledge sure. of Allegiance? Would you all please stand with me as we salute the greatest nation on earth? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, uh, I've got a few mayor's announcements, which uh, Jerry can catch up later on the tape. <laughs> um, had an interesting meeting at the Cal Water, uh, uh, at their headquarters with the city manager to get an update on what they're doing with the water conservation measures and the implications to our residents in terms of their conservation measures. You may have read in the paper that the Peninsula Cities did not meet their conservation goals. Well, I want to tell you we have the actual numbers from Cal Water, and that may be technically true, but Rancho Hello. Palos Verdes reached a 35% reduction. Hello? Are, uh, Jerry? I will hear you. <laughs> Jerry, are you online? Hello. Hi. Hello. Okay. Uh, so so uh, Rancho Palos Verdes reached a 35% reduction. Uh, which our goal is 36, Anybody so technically there? we didn't meet our goal, but that was a lot greater reduction Hello. than many of the other cities. <laughs> Jerry, can you hear us? Okay, you were still having communication problems with him. And another announcement, I've been working very hard with the South Bay COG to get our Western Avenue guidelines plan on, online for funding through Measure R, and I want to say finally, I have a piece of paper that says we're going to be getting some funding uh, to move that forward. So excellent, excellent. The cog. So I've been working Thank hard you. on that. I think Thank we're you for that. getting some progress in there. And uh, we also have some uh, recyclers of the month: uh, a Jerry Marcia and a Harold Goodman. They each have won a check for two hundred fifty dollars. Remember, recycle, and you may win two hundred fifty dollars. This is the city's way of saying thank you for recycling. In addition to winning the recycling drawing, these two have also won a personal emergency preparedness kit from the City of Rancho Palos Verdes Emergency Preparedness Division, a $60 value. Um, so now we're at a point where we need to have Jerry here. For, I'd like to have Jerry here for approval of the agenda. Jerry, are you online? They're still working on it? Um, <laughs> I guess we have a quorum. I guess we could we could go forth. Then uh, we'll go forth. with. Uh, motion for approval of the agenda. I'll move approval of the agenda, Mr. Mayor. Ms. Mr. Mayor, yes. um, I'll second that, but I'd like to see if we can, I'd like to see a show of hands of which oh. folks are here for what. So if there's an okay. item that has more folks here, we can move that up. How All many right. How many folks are here for the uh, um, Peacock issue? Oh, <laughs> well, I think we better move that up to number two. It's number three right now. I think we can dispense with number one pretty quickly. Okay. So think, your think proposal to is to move number three up after number one? Correct. How many here are here for the Channel View Court number two? Okay. Any here for Knoll View? Okay. That's a public hearing, so. Right. A public hearing. Yeah, we have to do that. 
Okay, well that's fine. So uh, the motion is to uh, move number three after number one. Correct. Okay. A second. A second. Um, and we'll vote. Okay. Mr. Mayor. Yes. I believe that um, Councilman Dehovic had mentioned to me earlier that he would like to pull from the okay. consent calendar. Um, we didn't get to the we haven't got the consent oh, calendar we yet. Okay. We're just on the agenda right now. Okay. Are you able to hear all right, um, so with that, we'll take a vote on that. All right, thank you. Councilman Mizetich? Yes. Councilman Campbell? Yes. No, we don't have Councilman Dehovic. Mayor Pertem Brooks? Yes. And Mayor Knight? Yes. Motion passes. All right, now we have public comments. Uh, next item, yes, public comments. And this is the section of the agenda for audience comments for items not on the agenda. I do have four requests to speak. And our first request is from Margie Byerschmidt. Okay. Which item is this, Mr. Mayor? This is public, public comments. Public comments. For items not on the agenda. On the agenda. Okay. Welcome. Hi. Hi. Good evening. Welcome to Rancho Palos Verdes. Good evening. Thank you. Mayor Knight and council members, I'm Margie Byerschmidt, the newly minted executive director for the Peninsula Seniors, Hi. and I'd like to thank you. Congratulations. I'd like to thank you for your ongoing support. We really appreciate that. I'm here to comment on the article from yesterday's Daily Breeze called Cities Explore Video Broadcast Options, which explored possibilities after the current Cox Cable Agreement expires in October. I'm here to endorse the option of continuing broadcasting as opposed to posting videos on YouTube. The live broadcasting of City Council and planning, uh, planning Commission meetings provides local government transparency through TV coverage. RPV TV broadcasting other City Council and board meetings would continue to provide transparency also. This is easy to access transparency. Certain members of the community, your constituents, are simply not techno-savvy enough to connect with YouTube. These are often the same folks who find it difficult to attend these nighttime meetings in person. You could unintentionally disenfranchise a percentage of older voters. And now a little pitch. We have recently started a free weekly technology clinic for Peninsula Seniors members to help them with their gadgets. They bring in their devices and their questions to get help from a wonderful student volunteer. It's still a challenge to involve some people in current technology. I thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah, congratulations. Richard Hess. Pardon me for bringing all this stuff. Uh, Good evening. My name is Richard Hess. Carla, can you set the clock? I may have uh, been here in this city for 41 years now. You want to pull the microphone closer yeah, to you so we can hear you? Please speak into the microphone so we can hear you. The microphone? Speak into See the microphone. See that microphone in front of you? Just pull it close to you. Yeah, there you go. My name is uh, Richard Hess. I've been in the city for 41 years now. Uh, and uh, I, I'm afraid I'm bringing up another subject. Um, um, Jerry, I just got to notice that the, it, it's actually the sound going out the video going, the video feed. No, Mr. Out. Mayor, may I request that um, so they try to deal with this? The reason you're probably not hearing it isn't because it is of the call-in, it's because the sound feed is... Yes, well, uh, um, uh, just hold out. on for a second. We're having some technical problems here, and we need to... I would suggest that Mr. Dehovic, that Councilman Dehovic oh, try no. to use the telephone and then watch it on Skype, and there's a 20-second delay. I've done that before, and it works, and... There's no interruption. Well, I'm going to have the technical okay. person try well, to work all this out, right? Well, it's not working. Okay. Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> it sounds like they've got that taken care of. You can go forth with your your public uh, comments. Okay. Uh, my uh, Richard Hess is my name. I'm a licensed structural and civil engineer living in the city. I I uh, like to talk briefly about the. Uh, uh, Moss Bank Canyon, uh, the trash and other things that are uh, thrown in there. Uh, I brought with me some wood. Somebody started a fire there. Fortunately, we don't have much uh, brush to burn yet. I also brought 
Uh, I've, I've got a, about a dozen bottles of cannabis here, which I understand is a drug that uh, has been deposited in the canyon. Uh, this is an area that, that uh, apparently is uh, uh, not policed. Um, uh, the police have been notified, but uh, nobody's been killed there yet. Nobody's died from overdoses. Um, but someday somebody might be. And I think this is something the city should be aware of and should take steps to correct. Um, Moss Bank is a small street that was never completed. Uh, it was uh, built uh, over 40 years ago before I moved here. Uh, and it was to be connected between uh, uh, one side of the canyon and the other. It never was, and therefore there, there's no cul-de-sac at the top. Trucks can't turn around. And uh, there used to be a culvert where you could walk up a dirt road, and that has gone now. And as I say, uh, this is a place where apparently I'm told uh, high school students uh, go there and a uh, large number of cars park up, up at the top and go down there and, as I say, leave stuff like this and run fires and one day's supply of bottles that are left there. Um, I, don't, I don't know if uh, this council is can do anything directly about this, but it's in our city, and it's owned by someone who does not live there, and it's a mess. And sooner or later, I think somebody's going to OD on this stuff and die, or there's going to be a fire there, and there's going to be big problems. So, thank you very much. Um, if I could just add, um, Mr. Hess, you might want to turn those vials of weed over to the law enforcement officer in the back of the room. <laughs> I would suggest you do. <laughs> okay. uh, any more public comments? Or public? Uh... Yes. And the staff will follow up. Yes. Sharon Lovies. <coughs> Hi, Mayor and group. Um, this is just a little letter I want to read from April 24th, 1990. Oh, I'm from Vista Verde Owners Association. We're um, going to present our case to you um, September 1st. Um, hold on a second. Is, is this concerning something that may be on the agenda? I don't or? think we're on the agenda. You are on the agenda tonight. We are? In a consent calendar. Well, on the consent item. calendar. Pardon? On the, on consent, the consent calendar. calendar. Ask the city attorney for Re opinion. City attorney, what, what's the proper procedure here? Well. As I understand it, Ms. Lovey's is not necessarily, she may, I'll just ask for a clarification if that's all right with the mayor. Yeah. Um, on the, tonight's agenda, um, on the consent calendar, is rejection of the application to file the late claims. The second one? Yes. Because uh, I didn't, yeah, I did get that in the mail. No, mm, I don't think so. It's not a public hearing item. It's just the it's just the rejection. Oh, you're of just claims. going to tell everybody, right? So, okay. but, so the bottom line is, if you are speaking to that item, you could hold your comments. But if you're not speaking to that item, and it's a general Green Hills issue, then um, go yes, ahead. Yes. How long? Can I ask a question? Yeah. Go ahead. How the consent? How long will that be after everyone here speaks? Oh no, the consent calendar comes next. Okay, after this. Okay, no. And this, you can speak on that item yeah, too. By yeah. The way. Okay. This is just something it's for everyone's information okay go okay. forth yeah it's from uh, arlene gleek does anyone know that name president of um green hills memorial park 1990. i just wanted to read um what a great job she did it says dear president of vista verde owners association 2110 palace verde drive north number 214. green hills memorial park was annexed to the city of Rancho Palos Verdes on January 5, 1983. The city has requested the filing of a conditional use permit, which also includes the consideration and approval of a long range preliminary master plan for our cemetery. We are currently in the process of finalizing our master plan, and we understand that a public hearing for this matter is tentatively scheduled for May 22nd. 
keeping with our long-standing reputation as good neighbors we would like the opportunity to present our park master plan to you for your consideration and input we would appreciate the scheduling of a meeting at your earliest convenience she sent it directly to our homeowners association i have a letter underneath with the condominium group next door to us this is how they used to do it and then back here i have all the objections that came from all the homeowners at that time and i just wanted you to know for your information it's a far cry com compared to what green hills has done currently so that's all i have to say okay thank, thank you, you very much uh, councilman Kelly. mr mayor quick question ma'am did you still i just want some clarification did you still want that item pulled from the consent calendar to, to speak it. about that or or are you okay with your public comments I'm okay with, I don't need to speak on the got it okay got it. okay thank you very much thank you uh any other public comments yes dave emmenheiser good evening good evening Mr. Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, members of the council, I'm Dave Amenheiser, and I'm the president of the C Bluff Homeowners Association. You may uh, remember from some of my past public comments that we're uh, C Bluff Homeowners Association is currently working with the community development staff to revise our uh, CUP. And uh, I just wanted to give you a little bit of an update. As part of our discussions, I was aware that uh, Public Works was going to come along and cut 14 feet into the curb into the city's right of way on uh, Palos Verdes Drive South, adjacent to Terranea. And uh, uh, I, just, I just have a couple observations and some questions you may want to ask staff for me. Uh, isn't this wrong season to be cutting trees in the middle of a drought in the middle of the summer and vegetation? Uh, my concern is it may not grow back. And Carla may be passing around, and I don't think I had brought enough, but the, the, the first photograph uh, is not the best looking uh, side of the road, but you can see over on the right hand side is the entrance to Terranea, which I don't know, I think the last count was contributing to 20% of the city budget. Uh, and then in the next picture, what you have is what we have now. And this picture is taken 20 yards from Terranea's entrance. When I took it today, uh, Terranea was behind me and the, land, the vegetation scalping was in front of me. And so uh, I just, I just wanted to come by and, and say uh, that I hope the city doesn't think that this vegetation cut is the end, and I hope that the city would join C Bluff, maybe Terranea, uh, in figuring out how to beautify that part of PV Drive. Uh, I did get a staff email that referred to this project as a roadside view restoration. Uh, this is not a roadside view restoration, didn't restore any views, and certainly uh, made the whole area look worse. Terranea can speak for themselves, uh, but I just wanted to alert you that it's our interest uh, that the city help us move forward with some kind of California native low growing uh, plantings along this stretch of road uh, so it doesn't look as ugly as it does now uh, which would make things nicer for my neighborhood certainly would make things better I think for Terranea and uh, I appreciate anything you can do and 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 lastly I would suggest uh, uh, when the sun comes out tomorrow, uh, take, a, take a, a drive and between uh, Terranea and on the, on the way to, uh, let's say, Portuguese Bend, you'll see in those two blocks what's been done to the roadway. And I look forward to getting help from the city and from Public Works in fixing it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. No additional speakers. The next item is city manager report. Nothing to add tonight, Mr. Mayor. Okay. Our next ne item. Our next item is consent calendar. Late no. correspondence was distributed prior to the meeting oh, regarding oh. items C, E, and J. Mm -hmm. And we do have a request to speak regarding item E. 
And I will pull item G. Um, Councilman Dehovic was going to pull this, and I'll pull this. Uh, this for the next to be used at the next um, council meeting. To be heard at the next meeting. To be heard at the, used. Heard at the next council meeting. Next meeting. Okay. And I would move that. We. I would move the approval of the consent calendar with that amendment. Amendments. Second. second. Okay. Do, do we have Councilman Dehovic on the, the phone yet? No? Okay. Well, we'll, we'll just move forward. Okay. Um, Councilman okay. Campbell? Yes. Councilman Mizzetich? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Brooks? Yes. And Mayor Knight? Yes. Motion passes. Okay. okay. Our next item then, since we have a request to speak, is item E. Okay. Uh, and the title is Adoption of Ordinance Number 572. Do we have Councilman? Hold on. Uh, Councilman Dehovic, are you on line now? Let's just okay. move on. All right, just continue forward. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear us? Let's just move on. Okay, go forward. Adoption of ordinance number 572, approving a zone change from open space hazard to single family residential, two dwelling units per acre for a portion of a property located at 10 Chaparral Lane. Case number ZON 2014 Again, late correspondence was distributed prior to meeting regarding this item, and uh, we do have one request yeah, to speak. Okay, let's hear the speaker. Minas Urelian. Good evening. Due to the regulation on open space hazard, the city has taken away property rights from the owner of the property on Chaparral Lane and put a cloud where the owner is not able to ask full value for their property. A new owner comes in and the applicant becomes concerned about property right and city council wants to entertain their, they take pretty right, property right very seriously. At this point, the, the, prop, the, the applicant does not have a property right because the property right was violated and was taken away by the city from the previous owner. The city council is granting the new applicant property right. By granting the applicant a new owner additional footage for construction, you have done so without proper compensation to the seller of the property. In this case, you have gone one step further. By granting additional footage, you triggered a change of zoning from R1 to R2. In a sense, you have doubled the value of the property without any compensation to the previous owner. For this reason, this application should be rejected and the property should be evaluated and the owner should be compensated accordingly. This will prevent the previous owner from filing a lawsuit against the city for proper compensation due to regulation imposed on them by open space hazard. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, I think we can uh, entertain. I'll move the staff recommendation right. on okay. this, Mr. Mayor. We, we right. beat this thing to death last time. Second. Second. And uh, any further discussion? Okay. Go ahead. Councilman Mizzetich? Yes. Councilman Campbell? Yes. I thought you, Mayor Pro Tem Brooks, I thought you had to recuse yourself on this item last time. Um, we revisited that. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, yes. <laughs> okay. And Mayor Knight. Yes. Motion passes. Okay, one more check. Jerry Dehovic, are you with us? Okay, well, we have to move forward. Let's just wait till we're told. Next item. Our next, <laughs> Our next item then is item number one. Knollview Drive, under public hearings, Knollview Drive, second appeal of a height variation, grading permit, extreme slope permit, and site plan review for a new residence on a vacant property. Case number ZON 2011-00280. The, this is a public hearing that was continued from May 5th, 2015, so this public hearing is already open. Um, 
and written protests were included with the staff report and we do have one request to speak on this item. Okay, uh, staff report. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. Uh, this item was before you back on May 5th where you considered an appeal of the project. Um, and I'm pinch hitting for Lisa Mikhail who's out sick this evening. Okay. Um, and so this is the immediate, there's the project, uh, the vacant lot. Um, you may remember the discussion that was before you about neighborhood compatibility and grading. And um, as you recall, this is the vacant lot that has the drop off and then it kind of levels off. But the big issue that was before you, and this has a long history, I mean, this project began in 2011. It was rejected twice by the Planning Commission in 2013, 2014. It was redesigned, ultimately approved by the Planning Commission in 2014. Then a neighbor appealed it, but their issue was the legal access of the driveway. And uh, at the last meeting on April, May 5th that the council heard this, I think there was acknowledgement that the driveway issue was a civil issue, but the council was open to changing a plan so that the access was taken straight from the street to alleviate the concerns. And since the applicant was willing to redesign, that's what happened. You directed that be redesigned. So now before you is a redesigned project. Oh, Is anybody okay? Okay, Jerry. Councilman Dehovic, are you with us? Okay, go for it. Okay, Joel. So um, this is the vacant lot, and then the issue was that there was a, a two other adjoining lots shared at the current access driveway, and as the previous project um, was utilizing that previous access way, and so the project was designed with access via this. Uh, this easement and then coming into the property. So given the commission, uh, sorry, city council's action at the last meeting, uh, this was the grading that was involved with that previous design. So now, and I know this is very hard to read, but um, what now what has happened is that they've, they're proposing a, a dri their own driveway apron here off of the street so that they enter via this, what, this graded uh, driveway to the garage so they are not going, uh, accessing the, the private easement. Um, and so this is now, as a result of that, it did increase the grading quantities, but minimally. Um, this is the, the basic uh, outline in terms of the changes. Uh, the previous project before you was 4,870 square feet. It has now been reduced by, by 250 square feet. Uh, the height has been reduced slightly by three inches. And then the grading has increased uh, from 213 to 466 cubic yards. And uh, so I know these are the different elevations from the previous project and the current project. It's almost, uh, it's very difficult to see to certain differences. There are some uh, uh, design changes as you can see on the different elevations, but essentially, and the applicant is here to explain how they, they, they took out a little of the bulk um, in terms of about 250 square foot feet that they took out of the project. Um, and so these are the, so you could see, I mean, from the big picture, it is essentially the same, but just some minor, minor uh, design tweaks to it. Um, and there's a number of findings that the city council needs to make to approve the project. These are the nine height variation findings. The, the critical one that the planning commission discussed and the, com and the council discussed at the last meeting was the, the compatibility with the neighborhood. Uh, you also have uh, eight, nine findings for the grading application that needed to be made. Uh, and these were also issues with the, with the uh, Planning Commission, but now with the revised grades, given that the uh, grading increase is nominal, staff is, is, feels that the findings can be made now, and so, and are also extreme slope permit findings. So the bottom line is that staff believes that the project has been redesigned to meet the direction of the City Council and is recommending approval. Okay. Yeah. Um, yes, Joel, so the uh, driveway access off of Nullview is that like now like a bridge? No, it, it's uh, graded. So it's a grade. Yeah, it's graded. Sorry. Um, so see, there's fill. So they're filling this area so that they can um, go down the driveway to the to the level of the garage. Is it less than twenty percent? Is it less? Than yes. Yeah. Yes. It is. Yes. Okay. There's gonna be a All nice right. big drain at the bottom. Well, uh, the issue you may recall there was drainage issues raised that they were going to be addressed during the plan check process to make sure that it. That, that right. Okay. All right. Do we have any speakers on this? Do we have Should one we request? Yes. 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 Okay. Go ahead. Stan Dennis. Good 
evening, Good council evening. members. Good evening. Uh, we've spoken with the applicant and his attorney, and, and we're lift the mic just a little bit. We're in agreement with the plan. Uh, there's one minor change that we've discussed with the applicant, which is that uh, paragraph 24 of the specific conditions talks about maintaining the uh, the foliage on the north property line, and we've also agreed to maintain it on the east property line, which is at the downhill um, boundary of our properties. So if, if uh, it would be acceptable to add that language, that would be perfect with us. Uh, did you say 24? Uh, item 24, yes. On Exhibit A? It's page 21. Page 21. Page 21, okay. So that was that on the north side and the east? Yes, north and east side property lines. Joel, have you discussed this with? Uh, no, this is the first I'm hearing, but that fine, staff is fine with that. You too. have no issue with that? No. Okay. And the applicant, we, we, uh, we discussed it with the applicant. Yeah, I was going to say, as long as the applicant's agreeing to yeah. it. Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Well, thank you for that information. Appreciate thank you very much. So, Next, Mr. any other speakers? No additional Mayor? speakers. Okay. I yes. would just like to ask the applicant to come up only to ask him that question, and then I would like to make a motion okay. that we approve this, but uh, with that condition added, as long as you're. Hi. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. How are you guys? Uh, uh, my name is Amir Asfani. I'm the applicant, the owner of the property. Um, I'm fine with that condition. Okay. okay. Thank okay. you. Okay. I want to preserve. The, I'm okay with preserving the trees. Okay. Thank you. Well, thank you. You know, thank you for making the modifications. Uh, I know Mayor uh, Councilman Dehovic, um expressed a lot of concern, as well as the rest of the council, on the entry, and I was concerned about the mass and the bulk, and maybe I would have preferred a tiny bit more, but this is clearly um, significant enough to warrant. Um, I think all the findings can be made, so I would move approval of the staff recommendation. Second. And this is a public hearing. Would you like to close I'll the public I'll close hearing? the public hearing. I just have one thing I want to check with the city attorney. This is a quasi-judicial decision, and the part of the staff recommendation is to grant the appeal. I wanted to be very clear in our verbiage in Section 1 that by granting the appeal, the city in no way is rendering an opinion as to the legal status of the, of the easement. That's correct. Well, I want to make sure it's written in there and it's, it's in the, the administrative record. I don't really see it written that way. Well, we took that language out because um, now that the direct access, the easement is being taken directly from the street, the issue about the easement is no longer really involved with the, with the way the, um, the project has been redesigned, but we can add that in there. Well, I the just... You know, since it's a quasi-judicial decision and we are granting the appeal, you know, I just want to make Correct. sure it's very clear by, by us taking that action, we're not taking any opinion as to the legality of the easement and so on. That's like. correct. I can certainly, if you'd like to um, uh, either give me a couple minutes now or if you'd like to um, go on to the next item and then I can read some language into the okay. record. Okay, all right. No, Mr. Yes. Mayor, I don't think that's necessary since it was already addressed in the last... Okay, um, I just don't want it to be misconstrued in the future by someone else uh, reading this. That's all. I would agree. With no. Your concern is noted, but I don't think it's necessary. Okay. All right. The council seems to feel it's not necessary. I just I've expressed my concern. So yes, yes, we can. Uh, Jim, I just want to uh, uh, <coughs> excuse me say on the record that uh, I know the uh, uh, the lawyer, Mr. Stan Dennis. He's a well-known and respected commercial real estate attorney. Occasionally. We will see each other's names involved in some larger transactions, and that has no impact on my vote on, on this. I just wanted to go on the record, though, okay. and say that I knew him. All right. Well, I can make all the findings as, as uh, outlined by the uh, staff. Yes, Councilman Misitich. When you're done, Mr. Mayor. Okay, I'm fine. Oh, I was just going to say uh, um, thank you, uh, Mr. Um, applicant. Yeah, uh, Stefani. I'm sorry, Amir Esfahani. No, no. Well, I just wanted to say um, you've done five reductions and five times you've come before either the planning commission or the city council. I want to thank you for your patience. Uh, welcome to No View. Marilis Hills is a beautiful community. So, congratulations to you. All right. If there's no more discussion or questions, we'll uh, take a vote. 
Councilman Campbell? Yes. Councilman Mizzetich? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Brooks? Yes. And Mayor Knight? Yes. Motion passes. Do we have Councilman Dehovic yet? Okay. I don't know what's. We're just going to have to move forward. Okay. As the, <laughs> as the agenda was reordered, we'll now be moving to item three, right. adoption of the PFAL management plan. Late correspondence was distributed prior to the meeting. No notice of the public hearing was duly published. Written protests included in um, the staff report. And we do have nine requests to speak on the PFAL matter. Okay, I'll declare the public hearing open. Thank you. Uh, I don't have hearing. a staff report. Thank you, Aura. Yes, thank you and good evening, Mayor at Night and members of the City Council and members of the public. Um, of course, as, as you heard from Madam Clerk, the item before you is the PFAL management plan. Staff is recommending three actions tonight. In summary, the first one is to adopt a resolution, thereby uh, approving a, um, a negative declaration, finding that there are no environmental impacts related to the adoption and implementation of the PFAL management plan. The second item is to approve the PFAL management plan. And the third item is to direct staff to begin with the trapping. With that said, I'd like to just briefly go through um, the, the management plan and the item tonight. The, the first item talks about the goal, the goal of the PFAL management plan. This item was heard first by the City Council in November of 2014, followed by February of this year. And at that meeting, at both those meetings, you, the Council received update numbers on the census that was taken on regarding the PFAL pop population. It was clear to the Council that, that some measures should be taken to reduce that population and, and staff had recommended taking that population down to the 2000 levels and that was the direction staff uh, um, wanted staff to go back and, and develop a plan that implemented that. So in summary, the goal is, is just that, to bring the PFAL population down to 2000, um, to the levels that were counted in 2000. We've, we believe that that could be uh, achieved in two steps. One is deterrent me measures in public education. The second one is doing the human, uh, humane trapping and relocation of up to 150 birds per year. Um, with that, there's a table here that, that's taken from the management plan but has been augmented um, to, to compare the, the 2000 levels versus the levels that were taken in, in 2014. These are just the numbers that just show you the percentage of increase. It's clear to, to everyone that the PFAL population has significantly increased over the years. With that in mind, here's a summary. I'm not going to go through each item here, but the, uh, one column is the, the um, deterrent measures. The other column is the public education and what staff uh, <laughs> intends to do to, to accomplish um, raising public awareness of what you can do to control um, P, uh, PFAL population in, in your neighborhood. Um, the main item for, that's to be discussed tonight is the trapping. And as identified in the management plan, there are five stages. The first stage, um, and this is in a, in a per calendar year, the first stage is to conduct a census every year, and that census would be done between February and March. Once a census has come back, if we need to um, bring on board a trapper, and we don't have an existing uh, service agreement, we would bring that to the council for approval. The third has to do with the seasonal trapping. Um, in here, uh, as noted here, it basically during the period of April and May, that's considered the nesting and hatching season. So it is, it is suggested that to, in order to, to trap humanely that you don't do any trapping, particularly for the peahen during that period of time. It's suggested that peahen trapping occur between July and December. And then the peacock, the male, can, can occur throughout the calendar year. The fourth item in the trapping are the different, the protocol that would occur that would be put in place uh, for trapping. And it, it describes the size of the cages, where the cages would go on private residences, provided that there's an agreement between the private residents and, and, <coughs> and um, the city, uh, measures on how that it's going to be monitored, what, what occurs when, when PFAL are trapped in the cage. That's all described in the trapping protocol. The fifth item is the relocation. And what I want to emphasize here in the relocation is once, once a bird is trapped, it becomes the property of the trapper. And in this case, that's uh, Mike Maxey with Wildlife Services, and he's here this evening. Um, 
where the birds are relocated will be screened by Mike Maxey and reviewed by city staff. So city staff will make sure that um, measures are taken, that they're, the new home for the bird is in a place where the lot size can accommodate the home, that there's going to be adequate um, food and water, and that the person that's taking the bird actually has some uh, um, experience with aviary um, or birds of that nature. So. That whole screening process will be done. I do want to emphasize that for protection of whoever the, the new homeowner is going to be for the birds, that um, that information not be public, that staff will keep a record of that information. If it needs to, we, we could sh share that information with the council, but it is for the protection of whoever is, is receiving the bird. With that in mind, the trapping as identified in the management plan today identifies the five neighborhoods where we've done uh, the census in 2014. There's the Portuguese Bend, Vista Grande, Grandview, Crestridge, and Sunnyside Ridge neighborhoods. I want to point out that in the maps that were distributed in the, in the management plan, uh, there was uh, um, the names for Grandview and Vista Grande were switched, so I've corrected those maps and I've actually <coughs> expanded those um, the area in Vista Grande because um, the map that was attached to the PFAL management plan didn't include all the streets that were surveyed in the census. So I just want to point that out. Um, here's Grandview, and this is the correct map for Vista Grande. And it shows you the entire area. Um, to that end, I just wanted to remind um, the council and the public that we have two ordinances in place um, that are considered infractions if they're violated. One has to do with sabotaging PFAL cages and the other has to do with feeding PFAL that is prohibited per the municipal code. Lastly, I want to remind the public that the best way to stay informed regarding this matter and to spread this word is to subscribe to the listserv for the PFAL item and uh, I'll periodically be sending out updates uh, to that listserv so that's the best way to communicate. Um, or uh, stay informed. And that concludes staff's presentation. All right. Any questions? Uh, Councilman Misicic and Mayor Pro Tem. Yes. Um, Aura, uh, how many birds were counted in the last sentence, uh, census? The, the last census was taken in, in October, I mean, in 2014, right. in June and in October. So the summer, the average of those counts came up to 278 birds. And I'll, let me go to that table. Yeah, ahead, Total of the five neighborhoods that were studied. Okay, but uh, you didn't do a wider sentence uh, census in the city? Not citywide. We just focused on those five neighborhoods. And, and particularly the Vista Grande, that's where we're getting most of uh, the complaints. Okay. Um, I also want to ask the question, um, so how is the number of 150 birds determined? It, it, it basically um, comes from the 2,000 count where you see it's 134, but you'll also notice that in, in 2000, we didn't count for the Sunnyside Ridge neighborhood, nor did we do Grandview. So what we incorporated those numbers um, from, from when those census were taken into that, and that gave us 150. Okay, it seems low to me, but. So see, in 2008, the, when the first count was taken for Sunnyside, there were 11 birds, so we added that to 134. And then the Grandview was, the first time Grandview was uh, surveyed was in, in 2014. So what we did is we took the difference between June and October and added that to this number here. And that's what we, we came up with 151. So we just, we, we said 150 and that's per year. So keep that in mind. Okay. Uh, and then um, city attorney, uh, just to reiterate uh, regarding the negative declaration for CEQA. Yes. There are no California fishing game or US wildlife issues uh, with this trapping. That's correct. Because this is not an indigenous species. Yes. It is brought in by man and therefore uh, exempt from any uh, environmental impact or anything like that. Yes, is that, and it's correct? All, that is correct. And it's also not in any um, protected species list under the Endangered Species Act. It's not protected or threatened. So, yes, you're correct. Okay, one final question. Um, we got an email as late correspondence from a, a resident who often sends the council weekly emails. Um, were you ever instructed by any city council to ask, the Los, ask Los Angeles County for special dispensation to allow residents to use small firearms to deplete the flocks? Absolutely not. Okay. 
Well, it sounds like uh, that was the wild turkey speaking. <laughs> oh. Well, uh, Salvo. Yes, thank you. I, I'm, actually, you, you, you asked a lot of the questions I had. Um, I did have a question concerning the OVO control. You know, I, I remember raising the issue as we deliberated this uh, last year. Um, and at the time, the decision, I remember with, speaking with Carolyn Petru about it, and it was my understanding that it, it was not able to be used because of the problems with killing off the, the songbirds as well. So it, we've received some interesting communication. I'm not talking about not doing the trapping. I'm just saying a way to control things for the future. Is this really a viable option? Because if it is, um, I'm just, I'd like to know what the status is. Has there been an update on well, that? Yes, and, and there, the there birth control pill is, for, as part of the late correspondence, you did receive um, some comments from a resident who's here this evening who's going to speak on, to this matter about the over control, which is a contraceptive. That typically is, is from my understanding, what was described in February, is typically used for pigeons. Um, we, at the time, back in February, suggested that we not use that in place of trapping as, a, as an effective alternative um, because there were there were some constraints with it um, the way I mean it, you have to feed the birds daily with, with um, these pellets um, and and that was going to be a challenge of how that was going to be accomplished there there was the, the concern that if you leave that out for the birds like part of their food as part of the trapping that other birds may end up um, consuming it it could be um, it could be dangerous for other birds, especially uh, protected birds. So they didn't. We didn't feel like that was the best um, alternative to the trapping. Of course, if the council wants to add that to the management plan as an option to to see if it actually has any effectiveness, we could incorporate that under under the deterrent measures. So that's of course at the council's pleasure, and we could incorporate that into. Just document. to follow up on that, all right, just to follow up on that thought, will we have to do a new MND? Because the Fish and Wildlife I might have issues with us with uh, doing that. Poss possibly. Yes, okay. That might be a, a beginning solution to some of the areas that haven't been identified in the, in the census yet, that are starting the, encro the encroachment is beginning in those neighborhoods. Yeah. So. Councilor Campbell, any questions? Yeah, thanks, Ari. You answered a couple of the questions that I had. Number one was the neighborhoods that we chose. You've you've got some flexibility in here to uh, to address other neighborhoods than just the ones that we're going to start off with. I mean, we can't do the whole city at at once. So I think this is a good place to uh, uh, to begin. Uh, the primary concern I'm hearing from residents is what sort of assurances, and you and you touched on this in your staff report. Uh, do we have if we're paying this amount of money? Almost, almost, what two hundred dollars a bird? Right. If we're paying this amount of money it's about to twenty-seven you know. to catch these birds and find them homes, what sort of guarantee do we have that they're going to make it safely to those homes? I mean, I know you'll 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 keep that internally with staff, share that with with council, but what sort of ability do you have to even audit the data that you get back? As spelled out in the management plan, the, the trapper has to notify the city within 24 hours of being called that, that, that a bird's trapped. They need to photo document it. They need to inform staff where the bird is going. Um, there, there are various locations throughout Southern California where the bird would go. The cost that, that is, um, that's being borne by, by the council for this is, I think, $175 per bird. But that includes not only transporting the bird, but actually all the monitoring, the cages, everything that's involved in trapping just an individual bird. So it's more than just relocating uh, the bird for $175. There's more to it. But but what's built into the whole system is a checks and balance. So so we are all monitoring where these birds are going and making sure that they're they're humane, humanely treated and that they're going to good homes. So that's that, that's what I would say to that. Well, and the other concern I heard is that I've gotten a number of questions from residents. If we're going to humanely trap and relocate uh, these, uh, uh, these birds, would it be possible in the future to consider trapping and humanely relocating some of the gophers up of the hill uh, as well? 
We can agendize that later. <laughs> I, I honestly got an email on that. So, <laughs> I think I, All right, I got a few questions for you. Um, so the, the program is flexible enough to include other neighborhoods. What is the criteria we use to include another neighborhood? Is it just the amount of complaints we have or what, what, what what's the criteria? Absolutely. I mean, when, um, if someone reaches out to staff and and they're in a different neighborhood and they're, they're expressing concern about the number of birds, we can document that. And when we go out to do a census, we can expand that census to to count that neighborhood as well. And and adjustments could be made yearly, whether the, maybe in one year the Grandview neighborhood doesn't need to be trapped because their numbers are are, are low enough that we could we can move that that work over to another neighborhood. Well, who determines if the Grand View area has a low enough number of birds? Is it the residents or the city? Well, so staff does. I mean, based on the, the census numbers, and of course, we'd bring that item back to the council to review. Okay. All right. I just, I just, I'm just wondering. If this is going to kind of roll out and become quite a large project down the road. I didn't, I'm not sure if there's any kind of cap on this or something. Uh, well, we're looking at about uh, we're looking at up to 150 birds per okay. year. It doesn't mean we are going to be doing 150 right. birds. One year maybe 30 birds. One year maybe 100 birds. At, at this point, for this year, and we're starting late in in the year, um, we have till December 31st. We'd like to do we'd like to be more aggressive and, and trap 150 yeah. birds. Okay. The other thing is you have on here the trapping protocol. The tra the traps will be serviced no less than once a week. So it could be as long as a week that they, they check on the traps. Is that, that true? That, that's an unoccupied trap. If, if, oh, unoccupied. If, that's yeah, my if you question. Read on, if, if a trap is occupied, the, the property owner where the trap is placed will, will contact Mike Maxey, who will then contact the city. They have 24 okay. hours. I just didn't want to have a situation with a bird in a, in a trap that it, without a week of food or water or something. Exactly. Okay. I just All right. And uh, the thirty-four thousand dollars does that include the distributing the educational leaflets to households? No, it doesn't. So that's an additional cost that right. uh, will be in the future. And um, I, I notice you have uh, some educational programs. It's very good to let people know not to feed the, the, the well any any wildlife really, but of, of the peacocks especially. I noticed. And the list of the plantings too is really important. I mean, from personal experience, I'm in the Portuguese Bend area. I have some drought tolerant plants. That have oils on the leaves that peacocks just don't want. So right. there's a lot of good plantings there that uh, they don't want to go after. Yes, Mayor Pruitt. had a. You just brought up another concept. What is the lifespan of a peacock? I believe it's 15 years. Oh well. Okay. So now we're entering to a new territory, because we've received some emails about in the interim between October, uh, June of 2014. That's a year ago. And now, in October of 2014, and now, as they are multiplying vastly, um, I think we need to be um, sensitive to the fact that we may need to look above the number 150. So. Okay, please, uh, no applause in the audience. Thank you. It's just, I mean, it, I, oh, that's okay. the question is, um, it, 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 there's we can been adjust a great discrepancy. Yeah. So. It, it's a good question. I mean, here we are. It, be the beginning of August, by the time we are going to actually physically be able to start the trapping will probably be uh, early September. So that gives us fall and, and early winter to do the trapping. We'll, mm -hmm. we'll do the 150. And then because the, the environmental review studied 150, then come next year, we could, continue, we could be aggressive then right. and do another 150 to try to control this population. Right. So it's a good start. Yeah. If Frank Vanderlip only knew what those 25 <laughs> birds were going to do. So I think at this point I'd like I'm to sure have the speakers so we can get, hear from the uh, audience. Okay. Robert Lindholm. How many speakers do you have, Jimmy? Uh, oh, nine? Nine okay. Where are you going? <laughs> I'll ask the speakers if you disagree with the agenda if, uh, item. I appreciate that. We're trying to get through the meeting, but go ahead. Go forth, please. I am uh, Dr. Robert Lindholm. I completely, absolutely, totally disagree with the Peacock Management Program. <clears throat> I am a biochemist at USC. I'm the retired executive vice president of regulatory affairs for Allergan. As the guy who got uh, Botox signed off, I probably know more uh, in, in a non-classified sense about deadly poisons than probably anybody in America. <clears throat> uh, I found out about this peacock management nonsense uh, late last week. 
I had previously seen something uh, as an agenda item. I didn't see anything back in February or I would have been here then. <clears throat> I immediately contacted Joe Rojas, who I know from a large piece of property that we're involved in in Portuguese Bend. And most of my comments have to do with Portuguese Bend specifically. However, I've been involved with the Hill since I used to drive my dad's 62 Corvette up from Gardena High. And my first office in 1973 was, I rented from Barney Morris at Grand Via and Hawthorne. So I, I, I go way back with PV. <coughs> and, most of these areas that have peacock problems <clears throat> had peacocks, uh, probably all of them had peacocks before houses were ever built on them. I, I will ask the audience, okay. can I, I ask? In, I, okay. I, as I said, I'm talking mostly about Portuguese band. Now, let me I'm ask the audience about. not to react to anything. Please, okay. you'll have your turn to speak if you put in a speaker slip. Thank you. I, I'm not here to argue in favor of birds. Uh, they're aggravating, they poop all over the place, uh, they jump on cars, they make a lot of noise at all hours of the day and night. Uh, my wife is the uh, bird bleeding heart in my family, <clears throat> and we have two parrot rooms filled with those chirping ass things that bug me to no end, so I'm not completely against you. But the way the city is dealing with this is probably illegal. But getting into my argument as to why having a trapper go out and do it, <clears throat> I'll, I'll start right off with what I found out in only a couple of days. Uh, I communicated and got a response late Friday back from ARA regarding contraceptive. Uh, there's, there's a contraceptive called oval control that you brought up <clears throat> that apparently was addressed back in February. This, uh, and as I said, no one knows more about poisonous substances than I, do, than I do. And contraceptives are so common now that human contraceptives for teenage daughters are about to go over the counter. They're so innocuous. So the fact that a bird would eat a contraceptive and not produce chicks is just, it's just, it's a no-brainer. It's, it was developed originally for pigeons. There are a number of off-label uses, including for peacocks, when you're referring in a pharmaceutical sense to off-label, that merely means that they didn't get it specifically approved by the FDA or the regulatory agency <coughs> for that particular Can you wrap use. up your comments, please? Pardon me? Can you wrap up your comments? Your time is up. We may ask you more questions later. We may be able to ask you more questions later. Mr. Mayor, I'd, I'd be in favor of letting him Finish I've, his, got about, uh, I've got about go ahead two and minutes to talk. Just, can you just quickly wrap we up have your a comments? Big, we have a four and a half hour meeting also. No, so. I understand. <clears throat> uh, after, I, I, I got an, uh, a late Friday afternoon email from Ara saying that the OVA control could not be used because the trapper who's getting $31,000 told them in February that <clears throat> it had to be used on dry concrete, dry flat concrete, and that it, it was uh, unapproved and vir virtually poisonous for other birds. I spent half an hour today with Dr. Don Harris, a veterinarian in Florida who is the expert on peacock management. They have way more peacock troubles in Florida than we have here. I told him the circumstance and he personally suggested, and I'll be happy to give you guys the phone number, I mean, I have nothing to hide, that he would suggest going with the oval control for a couple of years. That will drastically reduce the peacock population. You may have to have some moving birds around from these areas where they really aggravate people to some place like Portuguese Bend, but there's a lot of, there's a lot of open land around here. So <clears throat> the oval control position is just wrong. And <clears throat> you don't have to use a broadcast spreader. It doesn't have to be on concrete. You put a dish out with some oval control in it, and they gobble it up like crazy in the morning. You, they, they, they leave no stone unturned in eating everything put in front of them, as everybody here will, and nobody will disagree with that. So oval control is a possibility. Furthermore, the guy that we're talking to who already uh, wasn't completely honest about the oval control is a guy that you guys spent, what, $20,000 with in 09 to trap 19 birds? In his own letter to the city, he talks about uh, trapping 150 birds total since 2006, 70 of which were the 19 birds that he trapped for you guys in 09. 
So he works at LA Zoo. I checked on that. <clears throat> He's got a two-hour drive out here to pick up a bird. So that's going to be done, you know, every now and then. And they're hiding where they're putting the birds. These are pheasants. They can be eaten. They can be put on a plaque on the wall. We all know the horror stories about everything from humans to feral cats. And somebody from the city is going to drive out to Murrieta, or he can tell him he took him to Vegas. Can you please wrap up your comments? I, we I need done. to move forward. Oh, thank, okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Our next request is from Carol Mueller. A couple of things. We have a little uh, a box up there, and you have three minutes. It can tell you what your time is when the red light comes on and that you hear the beeper. Please stop your comments. Uh, and also asking the audience not to respond to what the speaker is saying. We're trying to just get through the meeting. Thank you very much. Good evening. Good, Good evening. evening. Carol Mueller. Uh, I support the city plan. I live in Vista Grande. If you look at the figures, I think you know why we do. They've totally destroyed the roof on my house. They poop all over everything. We can't wash them down anymore. And uh, one good thing I did find that was good was uh, removing the turf. If you put a lot of uh, cactuses in, they don't like those. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much. You. Melinda Barth. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. At any evening, you can hear this between two and five in my bedroom. In January, February, March, it's worse, far worse. It is louder. I can't make it louder. In fact, I can't turn it off either. <laughs> Just like the real thing. Just like the real life. Just like the real I am one. pleased that the city is going to do something about the problem we have. I have come close to murdering a chick. Were it not illegal and were it not impossible for me to face myself as a killer of a helpless animal, I would have done it. I'm relieved that the city is going to take over as it should the protection of its constituency. We don't need this noise. We don't need sleepless nights. We don't need to be awakened at 3 and 4 and 5 and finally give up at 6. Certainly when we bought our homes in our area, Flambeau Road, there were no peacocks. Mm. There are now. Although the courts of Louis XIV may have found the peacocks an affectation and something grand. They don't belong in our housing area. They simply don't. I don't see how relocating them to a neighbor's permitted aviary is going to stop the noise problem. I think that plan has to be revisited to a zoo, to some other place that is enclosed, perhaps. If a neighbor elected to take a bird or two and I listen to it in an aviary, I don't think I'm going to get any more sleep than I get now. The peacocks can reproduce six to 12 eggs a year. I think your idea of managing this problem is going to have to be accelerated. Today, if we were to want to bring into our community an exotic animal, we would need to get a permit. Let's say we wanted to bring in flamingos you would insist that we have a permit to do so. The peacocks aren't permitted, and they shouldn't be. They shouldn't be here. The city council would not permit us to bring in a rooster to fertilize our chicken eggs, because once in the morning they might let out a call. The peacocks go on all night. I think that it is important for realtors to let Potential homeowners know what they're moving into. Certainly on Flambeau Road, it is a reality. We now have peacocks, and they make noise. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Uh, Ara, just a clarification. The, the peacocks will be relocated off the peninsula entirely. Correct. Okay. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Chris Engen. Thank you. 
Good evening. Good evening. Hi, Good I'm Chris Welcome. Engen. Uh, my wife and I live at 73 Headland Drive, which I think is the sunny ridge area here. And I was just kind of curious for one thing, it's when it says 0% over here, but yet we had none in 2000 and 90 in October and an average of 64, how did we get to 0%? I don't, I don't know what that number, when I see zero there, I think you don't think we have a problem. So yeah. I'm here tonight, I'd written a letter, I think you guys might have read it, but we, we have a problem here. And um, one of the main things is, it's hard enough for us to get out of Headland Drive onto Palos Verdes Drive East from, from either exit without somebody roaring around at over 20 miles an hour. Mm -hmm. And um, the next thing you know, they're on your behind and so that, you know, we've, we learn to negotiate that, but every so often we come out of there and the next thing we run into is a, a, a brood of pea fowl. So now we're even slowing down more. And so I find them to be dangerous to our driving in that area. And the thunder was kind of taken, but this was uh, a, a 10 second thing at six in the morning from one of our bedrooms. And, I, and I'll stop there, but I will say that last night Last night, uh, it started at three in the morning and it went basically till six in the morning. And I never had a prejudice thing as peacocks or animals. One of my minors was animal behavior. I mean, I'm into this, but after having lived around them and seen what they are, I just don't feel that they belong in our neighborhood. And I really salute the city for stepping up and making a proposal that really tried to help us out. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mike Rosiak. Welcome. Uh, thank you. Good evening. And good evening. So I, I would like uh, to speak against the proposed PFAL management plan. Uh, I'm a 19-year RPV resident. Uh, my opinion is it's, uh, that the PFAL population is one of the beautiful things about the peninsula. I happen to live in an area where there are, are many. I appreciate the sound. I appreciate the look. And I appreciate the environment. Um, a comment about uh, the councilwoman's uh, suggestion to increase to 150. Uh, comments about the increase in the current year notwithstanding, if I do the math on this proposal, there's an average of 278 for last year, and if you pass a proposal allowing up to 150 a year, then in theory there could be zero uh, PFAL in two years. Is the way I read that, uh, if I understand the chart. Please hold your... Um, a comment also about the representation. Uh, obviously, the PFAL can't come here to express their opinion. Uh, I would ask all of you, relative to children in the area, if you've ever asked them if they appreciate walking down the street and seeing a PFAL. And I would say they're probably 100% enjoying the environment. Uh, yeah, there are some inconveniences. Uh, they make a little bit of noise and they make a little bit of mess. And, you know, so I appreciate the right of everybody here to come and, and express their concern. Uh, my personal opinion is that's a, a very minor uh, inconvenience compared to the beauty of the PFAL in our, in our uh, neighborhoods. Uh, they have been here as long as we have, you know, up to 100 years, whether they're indigenous or not. And, and I would say that it kind of reminds me when people move near the airport and then complain about the, the airplane noise. Uh, if you don't like the neighborhood around RPV, and this proposal is to move them to Lancaster, I would ask you if you think it's a humane treatment uh, to be relocated to Lancaster, and maybe some of you should, uh, should try that out. Uh, the high temperature in Lancaster, by the way, is 113 in the summer, and the lows for four consecutive months are typically uh, below freezing. Uh, if any of you have ever witnessed the capture of a peafowl, like I did five years ago when we had the plan, they don't kill them. And other than that, that's about the only thing humane about it. Uh, it was with a big butterfly net. I saw one captured uh, with a glove held upside down, um, crushing his legs. I don't know if it broke his legs or not. I don't know what kind of a vendor that you're going to use this time. Uh, but there's nothing really humane about the way that these, uh, these beautiful birds are captured. And so I advocate that we uh, do not uh, pass this proposal and look forward to addressing the Coastal Commission, if necessary, with an appeal. And appreciate your time to come here tonight and talk with you. Thank you. Thank you. 
Uh, just another a comment. Um, no, go ahead. I just want to make a general comment. Again, please, everyone ha has a right to come up and speak their opinion. You may not agree with the opinion. We just need to please let them do that without any kind of comment in the backdrop. So I just appreciate that very much. Thank you. Next speaker. Anka Rao. Who is? Okay, here we go. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Hi, Good Anka. City Council, Mayor. I just want to quickly say thank you to Mrs. Brooks, who was astute enough to bring this problem up, to listen to her constituents and bring this to the council to do something about our desperate situation. Thank you, Mrs. Brooks. Oh. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Holly Kane. Yeah. Good evening. Good evening. Good I'm Holly Kane. Uh, thank you, Mayor and Council people, for all you do for us. We, we do appreciate it. Um, thank you very much for getting on this case. I would just like to ask if maybe you could consider uh, a possibility that after we've trapped whatever number we decide is correct, if somebody is still terribly annoyed, if there could be a process that they could call and say, hey, my neighborhood has, it still has a real problem with the peacock and have that addressed. Thank you. Thank you. Mary Jo Jackson. I have nothing to say at this time. Okay, thank you. Okay. Sandra Sandoval. Mm -hmm. Good evening. Good evening, Mayor and City Council. Thank you for allowing me to speak. I am uh, coming, actually, uh, Sherry, Sherry Greenwood also sent an email in reference to the peacocks. And um, we're not finding that many. And uh, the second thing is, Palos Verdes Estates already has a relocation program for the PFAL. So if you know if they're eventually disappearing then eventually we won't have any like the last gentleman said and i do agree with the gentleman before who said if you do move into the area isn't it not your responsibility to do your due diligence so uh, with that being said because uh, you know i'm a, an equestrian and we have many people that move into the area that don't like that we don't have the city lights or they don't like, you know, the horse flies, but they choose to move into this area. So who's really responsible here to do the due diligence before you move in? So with that being said, I'd just like to thank you for your time. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. No additional speakers. Okay. Just a clarification, or a the program is designed not to eliminate all peacocks. In other words, if we do some trapping and we notice the neighborhood is down at a reasonable level, we don't trap in the neighborhood. It's, it's, a, it's a flexible program, but it's not designed to eliminate all peacocks. Is that correct? Okay, just to keep it at a reasonable level. Correct. Okay. Correct. In fact, the goal says um, to, to create an environment that supports the coexistence of peafowl within the semi-rural character of the city. Okay. All right. Um, I guess I'll close the public hearing. And any other questions or comments to uh, from Council Member uh, Councilman Misitich? Uh, time for deliberation. I mean, uh, comments. Comments, deliberation, questions, anything. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. You know, for for years, I have seen residents come to this council with an outcry. I have seen an emotion that I don't see often with any other issue. I've seen despair from people because their quality of life is being affected by these beautiful birds. I'm gonna be the first one to admit they are beautiful animals, but they are impacting the life of our residents. Since our public hearings or council meetings regarding this issue from June and October of last year, I've received numerous, numerous emails from residents. I was even interviewed by an LA magazine regarding peacocks. Um, but I have to say that the, the vast majority of uh, people sending me emails and people I've talked to are in favor 
of a trapping program here in Rancho Palos Verdes. I would easily say it was it's 25 to 1 ratio of people in favor versus people not in favor. Um, I want to make this perfectly clear. Not any one of us up here wants to see harm done to any bird. We want to see them relocated in a humane manner. I want to make that perfectly clear. And so for that reason, and because we're spending public money to do this program, I want to see a program that doesn't spin its wheels. And I'm afraid that 150 birds is spinning our wheels for the money that we're spending. And the, the emails that we've gotten recently for this council meeting, people are describing 20, 25 birds in a tree in an evening. Six or seven emails describe the same thing. Well, if you just went to those folks' house, you'd fill your quota with 150 birds. I know there's more birds than that. And if we increase the program to the 278, I think that was the number that you used, Ara, on uh, the total population that we're counting, Average. I bet you, I'll bet, if we went out with the goal to, to relocate, trap and relocate 278 birds, that there would still be quite a few peacocks around. And I am concerned about the quality of life of our residents. That's why people have come up here. As I said, um, I remember one council meeting, people were in tears. People were in basically the emotion of despair. And I, I've rarely seen that in and issues that come before the council. And I want to be, um, I want a program that is gonna do something about that. So I would like to see a much higher number of birds trapped and relocated. Mayor Pertam and, and Councilman Campbell. Okay, uh, thank you, thank you, uh, Mr. Ms. Titch, uh, Councilman Ms. Titch, that was well said. Um, you know, uh, we, we really are, very interested in making sure that any of this trapping is going to be humane. Um, I, I sympathize deeply with people who have been suffering in wee hours of the morning, but I take real exception to the comments that if you move near an area, that if you move to an area and you use an airport as an example, well, that doesn't hold water with me because if you move to Torrance Airport, and Torrance, if you move to the Torrance Airport area, and I was just there on a tour last week, which hasn't expanded, by the way, and that were to expand all the way to the coast, and that were to expand all the way back uh, east to Long Beach, uh, we would see a significant problem. And we have the same kind of problem here. We have an increase in a population where it was not. And I can hear where I live even, I, where we, we are not generally in a peacock area, but you can hear it is coming throughout, pervasive throughout the peninsula. Mm -hmm. And yes, Palos Verdes Estates, Sandra Sandoval has, <coughs> a, um, has a, a relocation program. They're not seeking to relocate all the peacocks. And Rancho Palos Verdes is not seeking to do that either. So I guess in the... I'm interested in, in two things. I am interested in, not, in increasing this number initially, and I am interested in looking at the overall control in a realistic manner that we may be able to use it going forward as long as it does not harm any of the other birds because that was the initial concern that we had about that program. And there are some areas where it is just creeping in. It's, it's creeping in the way we've had this creeping problem with uh, vandalism and graffiti and other things. So it is another situation where it's, it's a slow creep, not to eliminate, but to make it so that when we look at a peacock, we don't have to be upset, bothered, crying, hysterical, angry. Rather, we can say, that's a beautiful bird. You know, I'm glad it doesn't sleep next to my bedroom. 
But um, the point is we don't want to be overwhelmed with it. And uh, I fully support looking at this probably in a little bit more um, intense way because I am concerned with the number of chicks, the period of time, Mr. Mayor, that has taken transpired since this began, and particularly looking over there at that Sunnyside Ridge area, um, that in October of 2014 was 90, and they added 64. And I can tell you, I drive past that area every day, and I'm now seeing peacocks cross the street regularly. And that's Pearls, Palace Verdes Drive East, where Palace Verdes Drive East, where you're easily roadkill, even as a person. So we really need to look at these numbers, and I think be sensitive to the needs of the people, and uh, and respect the humane treatment of these. And I'd also like us to look at this over control process going forward. Councilman Campbell? Yeah, two things. I mean, number one, I mean, I would encourage my colleagues to respect other people's opinions. I mean, we don't need to be calling out their names in a public meeting that's televised like this just because you disagree with their opinion. I mean, these people should be respected that they spend the time. It's, it's what, 8.30 at night? They've been here for at least an hour and a half. Uh, to be able to come up, give their opinion without being called out by elected officials up here for simply having a different opinion than what some of us may hold. So I would ask for a little bit more respect for the public. Um, my point here is, and I'm going to echo something that Councilman uh, uh, Misitic said, we've got to do something. And I know the kids like peacocks. I happen to agree with, with the comment about how most kids probably like the peacocks. They do. I like looking at the peacocks when they're not making noise. I mean, it's, it's nice to have them in the neighborhood, but then ever so often where I live, they cut loose. And if it's at 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning, you can't get back to sleep. I mean, it does have an impact on your quality of life and being able to work effectively the next day. Uh, I'm looking at the picture of the, uh, the Grandview uh, uh, aerial photograph, one of the neighborhoods that, uh, that are going to be targeted. And when we first dealt with this earlier in the spring, I talked about how I drove from a, uh, a uh, backyard uh, wedding reception from the far end of Grand View up to Hawthorne Boulevard, and my kids had a little contest about how many peacocks they could count, and they counted 53. And, and we weren't really trying. And so my concern is, is with the cost of catching each bird, I don't think we've got enough money in our budget to really make a, a, a real noticeable dent. So there's something I'd like to say to everybody, and I know the majority of you came out here tonight to, to talk about the peacocks. I'm in agreement that we need to do something. I'm in agreement that we should go forward with what staff has recommended here. My concern is, is that after we do it, you're not gonna really notice any difference. That's my concern, so I think I would be in favor of, of, a, of a more comprehensive approach to this, targeted trapping, some, uh, uh, you know, some, some pharmaceutical use you know, to limit their uh, uh, you know, the reproduction, but just trying to buy our way out of this at 175 bucks a bird, I, I just don't think that we've got the money to, to do it. There's got to be a different way. But saying that, I am in favor of going forward with this. Uh, let me address also, I'm highly concerned about having some sort of real audit done on what happens to these birds afterwards. Highly concerned. If we're paying this kind of money, then these birds better be living a pretty good life. I mean, they ought to be, they ought to be staying at some, you know, in some four-star peacock hotel or something like that for at least six months after they get relocated. But, um, but with that, uh, I'm in favor of moving forward on it. And Mr. Mayor, I'd like to just correct the record. Um, by my identifying an individual... That meant to discuss the fact that, yes, it's very astute for that individual to know that um, there is a Palos Verdes Estates relocation program, and uh, not too many people may know that. So that was actually a commendation, and I really uh, uh, do not like the insinuation that there was any kind of a challenge there. Okay. But I do appreciate um, all of your comments and all of your feedback. All Thank right. you. Um, I happen to live in Portuguese Bend, and if you look at the, the numbers over the 14 years, definitely we are highly impacted. We're actually a smaller community than many of the other communities being targeted. Um, I have uh, a couple of Carinari Island pines in my backyard, and I hear these peacocks all night long, almost during the day. It's the males that do the squawking, it's not the females. 
Um, ah. But but I think we've done we've done a <laughs> trapping before. Shakespeare. And um, I'm in favor of the program, and I think the way staff has designed it, it's, it's a starting point. If we were to change tonight the number of being trapped or have the OVO control, we'd have, we, couldn't, we couldn't pass it tonight because we'd have to renegotiate the contract, and we have to do a new MND supplement uh, because of the OVO control. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm, I'm in favor of moving forward as it is and then see how it works and down the road see if we can uh, get this to a point where uh, it doesn't uh, have such an impact on the neighbors. So um, I'm in favor of as is so we can get, so we can get the program in, in place, assess it down the road and see how it's working and we can adjust it down the road. So I have a question. Yes. Is uh, it possible uh, to, um, were you calling on me? Yes, and then, and then okay. uh, Council Mr. has his hand up as well. Okay. Um, is it possible for us to add um, into this, even though this is a public hearing, into this recommendation, um, the request to look into the oval control? I mean, I did bring this matter forward a year and a half ago, and uh, we asked about the oval control as well. And now we have more testimony about how it can actually be very effective. So. Yep. Is, ha can we add that to what we're doing here this evening? As a directive to, to research about it, yes, absolutely. And we can come back next year when we report on uh, some more information. If the council wants to incorporate it into the management plan next year, then we could do that and we could recirculate sure. a, a new MND. I do want to comment on, on some of the... Um, the um, remarks made from the council this evening. Um, one thing I think it's worth noting is not only does Palos Verdes Estates do have a relocation program, but I also believe Rolling Hills Estates has yes, one as well. Do. So um, we've been actually communicating That's with right. those other jurisdictions. I think they're they're monitoring what we're doing here as well because we have more, I think, a more comprehensive, robust plan here. Um, in in terms of increasing the number. As Mayor Knight did mention, that we we circulated an environmental document that that analyzed 150 birds. So if you were to increase it, you wouldn't be able to adopt anything this evening. We'd end up having to recirculate another uh, a document. That being said, knowing that we're we're going to the trapping realistically will start in September. That gives us three months in the year. If we're aggressive, we can trap about 150 birds, and then the new calendar year starts January 1st, and we start that that trapping as well. And we have 150. Essentially, we could exceed the 278 birds within like six seven months. That's what I was going to say. That we could get 300 birds in a year and a half. 300 birds, if not less, being that the new calendar year starts. In question general, question for, yes, uh, for yes. Ara. Are, are we going by calendar year or fiscal years? Ca calendar year. Okay. I just wanted to be clear on that. All right. I have a question. Yes, um, the, so it's uh, alternative two says direct staff to conduct the trapping and relocation of 150 birds on an as needed basis or at some other frequency. Does that give us the opportunity to modify that contract to maybe do the 150 birds now and then see what happens in six months from now? Absolutely. And we can come back when we report on what, because we'll conduct another census in spring, and we can come back and report to you what the numbers are. And if need be, we can increase that because we'll have to appropriate money to continue doing this. But, uh, but I think the important point is, is what you're approving here is 150 birds per year, per calendar year. So, as Ara said, you could do 150 before the end of this year, a new calendar year starts, and then you can do another 150 probably in the first six months, five to six months of next okay, year. Okay, so that's like okay. an as-needed basis. Yeah, so, so that's okay. the as-needed part. Right. That's okay. The All second right. thing I wanted to speak can, to I is that, that. Um, to look at... Um, you know, an additional element to the plan. We don't, you don't, or we wouldn't need to change the plan tonight. You could direct us to study additional options. We could look to see if there's any other uh, um, added action we could take, come back to you. And if you decided you wanted to amend the plan and add it, you could do that. But I wouldn't recommend amending the plan tonight for something that we haven't fully vetted other than directing us to, hey, go vet this other option we've heard about and come back to you with, uh, with uh, its viability and if you want to then amend the plan at that time. So, so Ara, if yeah. we were to change the plan and it 
would that, if it changed the MND, what's the recirculation requirements for that for CEQA? 20 days. Okay. All right. Yes, Councilman Mr. Titch. Yeah. Um, hmm. Mr. Mayor, I can um, go ahead and accept what staff has just told me about um, trapping 150 birds before the end of the year, and then a new year starts the um, the quota all over again. I, because I was going to say, hey, I'd like to see at least you know this increase to 200, but not if it's going to complicate or, or delay the program. I can I can go with what you've told me. I think that's going to be a good initial start. If we and you know what, you may trap 150 birds before the end of the year. So. Um, I am uh, I am in favor then of what uh, what you've told me. Um, so, okay. Mr. Mayor, so would you be also in favor of adding um, not only the staff recommendation with the direction to staff to go back to research further the overall control program, so that we can further sure. see can what other options there are available because. Clearly, um, us money in the future. Yes, it's going to save us money in the future rather than to have to keep up with this. Um, this constant relocation and um, you know it's uh, I think it's money that would be and that would be pennies per day yeah, they'll come back to us with uh, their analysis and recommendations yeah. okay is that okay all right I'll make the motion then that we oh I'm sorry yes, Councilman Campbell. Uh, quick question are do you know where the uh, our sister cities relocate their uh, their peacocks I do not RPV maybe <laughs> <laughs> just ask it <laughs> I do not know. Look, I'm, I'm sure if we Would paid these emotions? peacocks 100 bucks uh, each, they just they'd go to Rolling Hills Estates. But, <laughs> okay. No, yes. I'm, I'm in favor of going them. forward on this. Okay. Okay. I'll make the motion that we adopt staff recommendation, and that we um, instruct direct staff to research the um, possibility of incorporating the oval control program uh, in the future. Second. Okay. Any more discussion? No. Okay. Take a vote. Councilman Campbell. Yes. Councilman Mizzetich? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Brooks? Yes. And Mayor Knight? Yes. Motion passes. Okay. Thank you. We're going to take a, a break. And uh, um, if you uh, are not here to hear any other agenda items, you can have your conversations out in the hallway. Thank you very much. Uh, let's see if we can get Jerry on the phone. I don't know what the problem is, but I do have to get the meeting rolling again. <laughs> and uh, we'll have the next agenda item, please. Okay, our next item is item number two under public hearings established permit parking on channel view court this supports 2014 city council goals infrastructure and citizen involvement and public outreach notice of the public hearing was duly published no written protests uh, included and we do have I'm sorry uh, three requests to speak on this item this evening it is a public hearing and also late correspondence was distributed prior to the meeting I'll declare the public hearing open and we'll have a staff uh, report. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and members of the council. We have a, just a brief report for you this evening uh, to bring up to speed. Are you on the microphone? I'm sorry. Can you hear me now? Yes, yeah, better. Mm -hmm. yeah, okay. Thank you. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and members of the council. We just have a brief uh, staff report for you this evening. Uh, again, my name is Melissa Countryman, senior engineer with the Public Works Department. We have assistant engineer Nadia Carrasco. Um, good evening, uh, Mayor and City um, Council members. My name is Nadia Carrasco, Assistant Engineer with the Public Works Department, and I am going to be presenting the uh, Channel View Court request for a neighborhood permit parking program. In September of 2013, uh, the city received three separate requests from the C Bluff uh, neighborhood to implement a permit parking program in the area. As you can see here uh, on our aerial, this is the entire Seabluff area. It was later recommended by the uh, Traffic Safety Committee to implement this program on Channel View Court only. 
Right next to the neighborhood, we have Terranera Resort, uh, Palos Verdes Drive South. It's um, on the north side of these two um, neighborhoods. Everything below Palos Verdes Drive South um, towards the ocean, it is within the uh, coastal zone. I would like to also mention that one of the requirements for Terranea's development were to provide 100 parking uh, public spaces, uh, 50 of them within the uh, resort area and the other 50 on Pelican Cove parking lot. In September 2013, the Sea Bluff HOA submitted a request for a permit parking program on behalf of the Channel View Court residents. 13 of the 16 uh, homes signed the uh, petition. These concerns were presented to the Traffic Safety Committee for consideration, and a traffic engineering investigation was recommended. This investigation took place on April 20th, 2014. It was an Easter Sunday, and a parking survey was performed by Weldon Engineering. This study was composed of two different uh, studies. One was the license plate survey, and the other one was the origin destination study. The streets that were um, under study was Channel View Court, Seawolf Drive, Beachview Drive, Nantasket Drive, and Sika Drive. For the uh, license plate survey, um, it was noted during the, um, from eight o'clock in the morning to eight o'clock in the evening, all the vehicles that were parked in the area were noted. Um, these were submitted to the Sheriff's Department to see whether these vehicles parked in the area belong to the residents or to non-residents. The origin destination study was to identify whether the motorists uh, were visitors of the residence or if perhaps they were Terranea's employees or patrons parked in the area. Also to identify whether the people were beach goers or trail hikers. Um, the study showed that a large vehicle, a large number of the vehicles parked in the neighborhood belonged to Terranea's employees and their patrons. And in May of 2014, the Traffic Safety Committee recommended to establish permit parking on Channel View Court based on these studies. Uh, they also recommended for the city staff to work with Terranea to discourage employees parking in the area. Between May 2014 and 2015, city staff had uh, a few meetings with the California Coastal Commission representatives and they expressed the uh, concerns from having um, preferential parking within a coastal zone um, due to the possibility of receiving a protest and this could be appealed by the California Coastal Commission. Also during this time, uh, the city coordinated efforts with Terranea to prevent from their employees to park in the neighborhood and the city staff also uh, periodically um, did field inspections of the parking situations. In February 2015, the city staff initiated an after study to be performed to evaluate the changes in parking conditions. This study was performed again on an Easter Sunday on April 2015, and the study was performed by Wilton Engineering. They did the same type of study as the previous years in order to have an apples to apples comparison. During the study, it was noticed that uh, there was a significant reduction of Terranea employees parking on the neighborhood streets, and they also noticed an increment of the uh, residents, visitors, guests parking in the neighborhood. In June of 2015 this year, the uh, Traffic Safety Committee recommended to implement a permit parking program on Channel View Court to be presented to the City Council for their review and approval. It is staff's recommendation to concur with the Traffic Safety Committee to adopt a resolution approving a coastal permit to establish permit parking on Channel View Court. This concludes my presentation. Um, and I also would like to mention that uh, Ruth Smith with Wilton Engineering is here. Uh, she's the one that performed both of the studies in, in case you have any further questions. Thank you. Questions? I guess just a reiteration that if there is that with the um, with the passage of this um, which is obvious to me needed um, 
if there is any spillover onto C Bluff or any of the other uh, neighboring roads, then the residents need to come forward with the petition as these did, 84% when they only needed 60%. Is that correct? Uh, we, uh, one of the uh, Traffic Safety Committee's recommendation was to observe the, uh, the conditions after the permit, parking permit's been established to see if there's any spillage. Okay. okay. I, I've got a couple questions. Um, on page two, the staff report indicates the study report also pointed out that the number of on-street parking spaces occupied vehicles on the Seabluff neighborhood streets did not meet the guidelines generally used by the city for implementation of a neighborhood permit parking program. And yet you have a recommendation to go forth with the program. I'm trying to understand that statement relative to your recommendation. Uh, it's been brought to the uh, Traffic Safety Committee attention and the city staff that uh, the people on Channel View they, and the HOA, um, they want to move forward with this permit parking. Well, my question is, your statement here is that it does not meet the guidelines used by the city to implement a, that a parking program. That is correct. Yes. So if it doesn't meet the guidelines, how are we, I'm just a little confused as, to, maybe you can explain why we're going forth with this if it doesn't meet the guidelines. Okay, well the guidelines, um, the, basically that's why there are their guidelines, they're not necessarily, we need to uh, concur with every single point dictated. If I could just add to that too, there's, you can take into account other factors and so that's what we're doing in this case. They are guidelines, but we don't have to follow them stringently. And so that's what we're taking into account here. Okay. And as to the Coastal Commission, this is, this is an appealable area. Um, is it the Coastal Commission's official position that they disagree with it, or are they just saying that it could be appealed? You know, I'll let me do that, because I've, I've been conversing with the Coastal Commission. As you know, the Coastal Commission has any issues with anything that tries to prevent the public from accessing the coast. And so I think they've expressed, uh, as they do with every city that attempts to permit parking along the coastline, that, that they may have issues or concerns of ultimately what has passed. So uh, with your approval of a coastal permit tonight, this is an appealable area. The Coastal Commission will get notice. If there's an appeal, um, then we're going to have to deal with the Coastal Commission. And, okay, so and they haven't issue. indicated they would or would not necessarily would or wouldn't, but it could be appealed yes. is what you're yes. saying. Okay. And I noticed down here that there's a... Um, I just accidentally turned my Mac off. A methodology in which any member of the public could apply for a one-day parking permit uh, enable he or she to park in Channel View for coastal access. Is that part of this proposal? Not at the moment. Uh, we, uh, the Traffic Safety Committee, uh, recommended for the city to start looking into that. It's not part of this. But you're going to be looking into that? Yes. Okay. And where would they get that permit from, the city hall? We're still working on the details of that, but yes, okay. most likely they will go to the city hall. Okay, uh, Councilman Campbell. To follow up on that uh, question, is that something to help uh, defray any concerns about the Coastal Commission and the public's access to uh, to the coast, this, this one-day parking plan, or, or is that something that the local neighborhood is, uh, is in favor of? Um, it was the uh, Traffic Safety Committee's recommendation in order to um, in order to yes <laughs> to, to try and help help with allay those concerns but in speaking with the representative from the California Coastal Commission they said that that wouldn't necessarily guarantee that the uh, program wouldn't be appealed because it's still considered as making it more difficult for a member of the public to park on that street if they would have to get a one-day pass okay so I may have, a, okay, I may have some uh, some questions after I hear the uh, the public speakers uh, also in, in regards to this. But thanks. Just to follow up on that, um, so that was a recommendation from the Traffic Safety Committee to you look into it. Correct. It's not part of what you're asking us to pass tonight, but they just recommend to look into it. Right. Okay. All right. All right, let's hear from the speakers. Okay. Our first speaker is Dave Emenheiser, and this is a public hearing, so uh, as the guess it would be the applicant he would get 10 minutes oh 10 minutes I won't you're the applicant you. yes how about that wow how about that mr. mayor um, mayor pro tem members of the, of the council thanks for having me back can we put the overhead of uh, of the uh, long point area back up 
Dave, I wanna, can I just clarify? Are you yeah. representing the homeowners association? Yes, I'm the president of the homeowners You're representing association. the homeowners association. Yes. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. Yeah. Perfect. Now, and then if this works, it's funny being on this side. Uh, do you have a pointer for me, or that should control the cursor, Dave? Yeah, that's what I thought. Too. Okay. Here, we'll, oh, I see. Oh, that's kind of interesting. Okay, just uh, Mayor and I, before I get in my presentation, just to answer your question. There are two problems in Long Point. Oh, that is really strange. It's counterintuitive. The villas that have been there since the 70s have 250 parking, parking spots and roughly 500 cars. And so as the number of people have increased, they park on Beachview, they park on Nantasca, they park a little bit on Seacove, and they park on Seawolf. They don't really park on Channel View because Channel View is kind of far away. And so uh, there's two different issues here. Channel View is more affected by Terranea. Uh, the rest of the streets in our area are more uh, uh, affected by the villas. And so uh, anyway, I just, uh, in terms of my remarks, I'm speaking in, in support of the staff recommendation. Uh, a little over five years ago, a wonderful thing happened in our neighborhood. Uh, Terranea opened up. And... Uh, the good news has been uh, is that it's been been a wonderful asset to our neighborhood. The bad news is it's over the last two three years it started being as Terrane became more popular it's become off site parking initially for employees and that problem has decreased over time. Now the bigger problem is guests trying to avoid paying the. 10 bucks uh, to park in Terranea. And so uh, if we can go back to, to my, uh, my, my first shot, I just wanted to, uh, to give you a little bit of background. This is two thirds of, of Channel View Court. It's a, a one block long street and it has 16 residents. And this is about two thirds of it. And this is what it looks like on a Monday morning. Uh, you'll see a couple vehicles uh, from one of our residents uh, and that's it. Uh, can you go to the next shot? Uh, the, and the shot after that. This is what it looks like on a Saturday. And so uh, basically what happens in the public safety, uh, uh, I'm sorry, the consultant report backs it up, is that these cars start stacking up and we realize that Channel View is a public street. But uh, because we become overflow parking for Terranea, we are requesting the city give us some relief so that it can be uh, semi-reserved for our guests and for our residents. The, uh, uh, and then go back to that other uh, shot. Now, if you, and let's <coughs> see if I can get the cursor going. This gentleman here. Oh, gosh. It is so strange to do that. Ah, there he is. That gentleman right there got out of the car that was parked right, about right here. Now, I don't want to be one of those one of those people that's taking pictures and you know making sure kids don't kick their ball into my front yard and things like that. But this goes on on a regular basis and and you've gotten some late correspondence uh, to to attest the fact. I don't know if they're tearing a employees or people trying to avoid the 10 bucks. I don't see too many people getting their dogs out and water bottles and walking sticks to walk down to the coast. If you want to walk down to the coast, there's a lot of places to, uh, uh, to park over like at Vanderlip Park if you want to get closer uh, to the ocean. And so the, um, uh, we're asking for, for your relief. Our, uh, our original request was made in spring of 2013. Uh, and so therefore we've been at this for two years. Uh, twice we've received favorable votes from the Traffic Safety uh, Committee. The Sea Bluff Homeowners Association voted in support of, par of uh, permanent parking for Channel View back in 2013. You saw that we have 86% uh, uh, of the people. Think how many times you get 86% 80, of people on one street to agree on something. Uh, but we've got 86% that signed the original request. And in terms of the staff report, I would just point out the uh, parking study uh, found uh, uh, in 2014 that 72% of the cars parked on the street were by non-residents, that's on page 40, and a year later the problem had increased to 80% and that's on page 65. 
The uh, uh, Tyrannea uh, has made, I think, great strides in reducing the number of employees who park on Channel View. And uh, what is, uh, but again, what has happened is as they increase their parking fee from five bucks to ten bucks, it became uh, uh, Channel View with that little walkway that goes right to the entrance of Tyrannea. It's the closest way to access Tyrannea is from, from Channel View. And so, uh, and then page 86 of the staff report contains the supportive email from Terry Hack in support of our, our request. We did have a couple letters in opposition to people that, that don't live in the neighborhood. And frankly, one, one gentleman had an ax to grind with Terranea from looking at, it, at his letter. Uh, inclusion, in conclusion, I think this is an easy vote for the council uh, in support of the staff recommendation. Uh, you have the signatures of 86% of the people who live on the street. Uh, you have the support of the affected HOA board. You have two votes by the Traffic Safety Committee and the, uh, uh, the support of Karen A's, uh management. So um, my thanks for your consideration and be happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Yes, Councilman Campbell. I've seen the price generally $20. It's only 10 if you actually have dinner there or something and, and get it validated. But if you okay. want to just go and walk around or yeah. or something, I mean, it's, it's a yeah. $20 fee. Oh, which, oh, and then maybe that's what they're avoiding. Um, Mickey and I like to have dinner, so so I, I get it for the $10. It, it, maybe that's what <laughs> yeah. it is. But uh, but I think that goes a long ways towards explaining why you see that, that, mm -hmm. you know, that pushback. Uh, Plus, I've noticed that the parking spaces, the, the public parking spaces are almost always full. So I, yes. I, think, I think part of this is just the popularity of, uh, of Terranea, and there just isn't enough parking spaces down there. Uh, sometimes yeah yeah I mean it's from the city's perspective it's a wonderful problem to have you know one of the things we looked at is over in the Abalone Cove HOA they've got permit parking signs up in their entire neighborhood and I was told uh, by Lowell that the reason they went to that was because uh, <laughs> you know because the Abalone Cove I think the parking was five bucks and so they had a problem for five bucks and we have a problem for ten and twenty dollars question a uh, question of the uh, of the staff how are we going to police this? I mean, is this going to be on the sheriff's department, or is this going to be in conjunction with what we're doing up at Del Cerro? Have we have we, have we sorted out those details yet uh, to actually enforce it? Yes, it would be primarily with the sheriff's department at this time, and then if there's other agencies or organizations that the council approves at a later date, those could be used to supplement those enforcement. Okay, activities. thanks. Yes, Mayor Yeah, I would just like to ask um, City Manager a question. Uh, this has been said a couple of times that there is $20 parking at Tyrannea. Um, I've never seen that, even with a valet. So can you explain that to me? I'm not aware of their policies. I, uh, I do know if you use the valet and stay at the, and use the restaurant, it's $5. Yeah. And it's so I'm, I'm not, again, um, I, don't, I don't know if they've raised their fees on the weekends and... Things like that. They may and have I don't, raised I know, it to I know $10 at the valet, but I've never seen a $20 par parking fee. At well, I'm, I'm not usually down there during Even happy hours, so I'm, I'm usually down there at family time, and it's 20 bucks. Hmm. Yeah, we and it's $10. Ten dollars is what I'm aware of. Know if you're I correct guess we're not going to resolve that here tonight. <laughs> <laughs> um, Dave, just a quick question. Yes, On that sir. walkway, is that something that Can your community you. could... Uh, close off and just have access to the community alone or yeah you know that's uh, that's an interesting question and uh, you know Bob Nelson our our, our former uh, board uh, uh, treasurer ha probably has more history with it than I it's really kind of a nice walkway and it takes you right up to the light uh, uh, there there at turn a and it's a nice hill you know and and again our goal isn't uh, you know slam a barricade down at the end of our street or anything like yeah, that we're okay. just we're just frankly we're just trying to keep it down to a dull roar right. uh, especially especially on the weekends when we like to have family visit us too okay all right thanks a lot thank you sir thank you ma'am any other speakers craig lund Welcome. Good evening. Uh, thank you. Uh, let's see, I'm also on the uh, CBLF uh, board, uh, homeowners board. Uh, I live on Channel View. And it's, it's, it's 
it's hard when you on the, leave on the weekend and you come back and you can't park near your house. You get to park down the street and it's getting worse and worse. And even this last weekend, they started parking on the home side of the street and taking those spots up. So, so the problem's getting worse now. And I think it is because of the, the park, you know, the, the fee for the parking. There are some employees that, because we see them in their uniforms walking down there, uh, but that has gotten less over time. Um, so it, it is an issue. Um, you know, in their non-residence era, we don't know who these people are, where they are. My car was broken into. I don't know that it was related to that. But, you know, it's just bringing other people into the neighborhood that that normally this street is quiet. It's a dead-end street. Nobody is down that street unless you got business on that street. And this is promoting traffic onto that street. As far as blocking off that the gateway there. I think they just tromp through the plants and the bushes unless you put a fence around the whole yeah. the whole thing. I don't I don't know that that's that's a solution uh, to that. Um, so you know I'm in favor of this and I hope that you approve this. Thank you. Thank you. And our last request is Bob Nelson. Only if you have questions. <laughs> Any questions of Bob Nelson? Uh, Councilman Campbell. Bob, can you come to the podium? Thank you. Sure. For the record, I'm Bob Nelson. I am a member of your planning commission, but tonight I'll be speaking as a resident of Sea Bluff. Your question. Bob, when I see these, uh, I mean, I've driven by there and I've, I've seen some of the traffic uh, problems. Is it every weekend that it's that bad or just the heavier weekends? And how often are you seeing it bleed over to both sides of the, of the street? We have seen it bleed over to both sides of the street probably within the last four months. Uh, Terrane has become immensely popular on the weekend with weddings uh, and also group gatherings. I must say I appreciate, and all of us at Sea Bluff appreciate the city making that parking lot available to them. It has taken all of that traffic out of the neighborhood. But when you have 1,700 employees and probably 800 working the day shift and they're late, where are they going to park as close as they possibly can? So they'll bypass the city and they'll come into the neighborhood. And that's what we're seeing. Uh, it is, as, as uh, Board Member Lund has said, it can be very severe on the weekends. We can, on occasion weekdays, see it if they're having a major wedding. That's my answer. By the way, blocking that path, I don't know, Mayor, I'd have to ask you, what does it take in Rancho Palos Verdes to remove a path? I don't think it's that easy. Uh, the path has been there since we were developed, and this area was developed, and I have pictures of it, in the year of 1990. That's when the homes were built. That's when the path went in. Are there any other questions? Oh, by the way, my wife was president at the time this was initially presented to the Traffic Safety Committee, and Sandy is here tonight in case you should have any questions of the then president. Uh, are there any other questions? You got out of it, Sam. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much, Bob. Thank you. Yes. Thank you very much. Any more speakers? No additional speakers. So I'll close the public hearing. Any more questions of staff? No, I have any questions. I just have one, one question. Um, on finding number B, we're supposed to find that the proposal is uh, consistent with the public access recreational policies of the Coastal Act. But in the analysis, you're only discussing the coastal specific plan. Um, are you equivocating the coastal specific plan with the Coastal Act? I, I just want to make sure I understand what we're, what we're approving here. Yes, uh, to get approval of our coastal specific plan, it had to be found consistent with the Coastal Act. So what we typically do is is um, use our coastal sorry our coastal specific plan to make this finding. Okay, I just want to make sure I understood that clearly because right. they're two, they're two different documents. Right. Yes, yeah. true. Okay, thank you. So, Any questions? well, given that the there are not these challenges with the coastal specific plan or the Coastal Act and. You know, given the fact that we were talking about this with regard to Del Cerro, um, and we're going to see more of this as 
Rancho Palos Verdes becomes the destination resort, hotel community, the destination city, clearly, in um, Southern California. So I would say this encroachment is demanding that we protect our taxpaying residents and that access to the coast is required by the Coastal Act, but as you said, um, Mr. Mayor, with regard to Del Cerro, you know, um, providing parking is not. So, whoa, okay, so now. <laughs> Um, so I would, I would say that um, clearly this neighborhood is being impacted. It would be nice if we could try to contact, um, do, make some more contacts with uh, Terranea about any potential for staff members parking there. But I do suspect that it is a situation where uh, regardless of whether staff members are parking there, somebody's going to be parking there right now. So I would move the staff recommendation wholeheartedly. Second. And I'll speak to it. I, I also agree. We, we are kind of in a new place in the city. Uh, we've, we have some wonderful recreational facilities here, preserve the trails, Terranea, so on. And uh, it is beginning to impact uh, what we hasn't been before. So I think we're kind of in, gradually eventually moving to a place where we're going to have restricted parking in various places in the city and del cerro is one of them and i assume the uh, enforcement will be similar to del cerro uh, if i understand that correctly um, so i'm in favor of it I, I empathize with your situation and uh, we need to kind of preserve the quality of life that we have here and that's that's our job as council members yes i'm in agreement with that uh, I mean, unfortunately, it's unfortunate, I think, that we have to go to restricted parking because it, it's, a, it's a very recent phenomena uh, over just the last couple of years. And I don't see any other way but to go to selected restricted parking in order to do just that, to, uh, to help preserve some sense of what, uh, of, of what we've all uh, came here originally for and, and continue to, uh, to live here. So it's, it's unfortunate, but... We've got to protect these neighborhoods that are that are the closest to uh, these uh, uh, these destination points, and um, and I'm ready to vote. Okay, let's have a vote. Councilman Misitich. Yes. Councilman Campbell. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Brooks. Yes. And Mayor Knight. Yes. Motion passes. Congratulations. Okay. Thank you, Council. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you to the staff. Thank Appreciate you for a good it. presentation. Yeah. Good evening. So we'll have the next agenda item. Under regular business is item number four, joint tax transfer resolution related to City of Rolling Hills reorganization number 2013-04 for the detachment of a 0.18 acre portion of the public right of way of Crenshaw Boulevard from the City of Rolling Hills and the annexation of said public right of way to the City of Rancho Palos Verdes. Yes. Mr. Mayor, I'd like to make a motion to waive the staff report and move the staff recommendation. Okay. I will second that motion. Have you? Let's, uh, without objection, that'll be the order. You can just make a summary, okay. a summary of the subject matter, perhaps. Do we need to uh, we will need voice, voice vote? Yes. Oh, we'll voice, voice vote. Okay, we'll fine. Let's this, do voice since vote. Since it's a, a joint resolution. <sighs> Councilman Campbell? Yes. Councilman Misitich? Yes. Mayor Pertem Brooks? Yes. And Mayor Knight? Yes. Motion passes. Our next Thanks item is item number five, enhancing park operations and maintenance. And late correspondence was distributed prior to the meeting regarding this item. Yes. Um, uh, can we close the door or ask yes, people to so the audience? We're going to get that taken okay. care of. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, and I should note we do have one request to speak on this item, too. Okay. So, a staff report? Yes, Mr. Mayor and Council, before I turn this over to our Director of Rec and Parks, I want to say that this um, uh, staff report is brought to you. It's uh, brought back from a previous Council meeting. It includes uh, staffing at the parks that we spoke about before. However, it does not include staffing for the preserve. Uh, I received a request from Councilmember Dehovic to provide more 
uh, background data to the council uh, regarding uh, funding roles of city staff compared to uh, the preserve and so we're preparing that and we'll get that, that to the council very soon and then obviously take direction from you if you'd like to see a proposal back on your agenda regarding staffing for the preserve to address uh, trash issues, enforcement issues, things like that. So this proposal, I just want to make clear, just deals with the city parks. Um, well, and so I, I want to make that clear. Mm -hmm. I would just like to make a request that um, since Mayor, uh, Councilman Dehovic requested that you not do it, that we actually do come forward and get that because we own that land. So there is going to be some sense of responsibility somewhere. As once we get the background on it, um, I would like to see us address that issue. Uh, if you'd like, we could bring at the next council meeting, bring the proposal back along with the background information so it's all encompassing and then the council could consider that at that time and we'll certainly do that. Okay. So okay. Sounds reasonable. We'll pull yeah. the whole item. No, no, we're not. We're, we're continuing we're to this. get more information. Is we're going to take no, no, this so, item tonight. Uh, this item now. Yeah, Councilmember Brooks was requesting that we do come back with staffing and information on the preserve area as a separate as agenda. a separate, separate agenda. Item. Okay, I see. What so, you mean. so we'll have that on the August 18th agenda. Okay. Well, I, I would concur. I, this has been an issue with me for years. Uh, there's uh, people I don't know if uh, the council members have gone to the meetings between the public, the staff, and the Land Conservancy where they're discussing issues in the preserve. I've been there in several meetings, and this has been an ongoing problem, uh, not only with the damage that's being done to the preserve and trash and graffiti, but we need to clarify the relationship between the city, the Land Conservancy, and, and that is something that um, we just need to make it very clear, and this might be a good opportunity to focus on uh, how to do that so we can achieve the goal we're trying to achieve, which is prevent the damage to the preserve. Um, there's certain spur trails that they <clears throat> put up bushes and uh, stamp them down with, with cables, and then somebody comes in and vandalizes it. So there's, there's a lot of issues in the trails that we don't see in our regular parks and so on that uh, I really want to finally get a, a, a closure on and find a plan and program where we can um, start protecting our preserve. So I, I agree with it. I, it's been something I've been had an issue with the city for a long time. So I like to see that come forward. So uh, at, so we're going to separate out the preserve for now. We'll come back with that. And so right now what we have before us is uh, what we have are basically the outline parks in a, in a program. Yes. So, uh, so we have a brief staff report on okay. that, if you'd like. Jim, so. yes. Do you mind? Oh, I'm, so, I'm sorry. In? I'm sorry. Uh, could, we, could we also get included on that next uh, report just a brief overview as to some of the technology that's available out there? I mean, the, uh, you know, the ability to take a quick picture and it, it sends the GPS coordinates you know, off to the city. There's some apps out there that other cities are using where it'd be very easy for people. For example, take a picture of you know, graffiti, have an email to send it to, and it tells the city on a map just exactly mm -hmm. where it is. And, and Sure, our, our new graffiti um, uh, G, GPC uh, has that app, and so they have some pretty good demonstrations that will try and get to the council meeting so not only all of you can see it but citizens as well and and, and, and that's where i'm going at with this sure. you know rather than you know taking up more staff time to have them do roving patrols is let's let's empower our residents to be able to take some ownership uh, uh on on this problem as well and help contribute to uh to the solution uh, and the second item is uh is i'd like some clarification also on uh, on the land conservancy's role because i never see any discussion coming from them about who owns this land. I mean, there, there seems to be very much a sense that they own it, it's their land, uh, and, and I don't see that it's the residents' land, the city owns it, the people of the city uh, uh, own it. We're huge contributors to, uh, uh, to their budget each year to, to maintain it, and part of our job is to make sure that that money is, is well spent you know, on behalf of the residents of the city and not on behalf of the Land Conservancy. Mm -hmm. Well, my understanding, and maybe staff can correct me on this, but uh, the, city the, the city owns the land. The Land Conservancy has a contract to manage it. 
But their fundamental contract is to manage the habitat, and that's where we get into some issues of, of managing vandalism, graffiti, and, and all kind of stuff. So those we do need to, to kind of straighten out and make sure we have a clear picture of that. Sure. They, but they've, they've got wide ability to change the names of trails, roads. They can sell off uh, monuments. They can build monuments, sell them off. I mean, I mean they've, got, they've got in their current contract – uh, surprising latitude uh, uh, to be able to develop the preserve. So, uh, Mr. So Mayor, I, yeah. I, did, I do want to uh, caution the council. This item is not on the agenda right. tonight. So I brought it agenda. up to say it'll be on a future Thank agenda, you. if you wish. Yeah, that's a good, so we that's good point. Well, that's what we need clarification on. Right. Yes. Thank you. So we'll have that discussion in the future. Right. All right. So let's have a staff report, and then I'd like to hear from the speakers. Thank you, Mayor, City Council. As you may recall, at the June 30th City Council meeting during the discussion about the Parks Master Plan update, a number of residents speaking about that, speaking that evening noted concerns about trash, graffiti, crime, safety, and vandalism at city parks, open space areas, and facilities. Uh, the City Council shared these same concerns and directed staff to apply a broad, less is more approach, with an emphasis on proactively maintaining and improving the appearance of the city's current facilities, parks, and operations. Uh, council further directed staff to look, at, look into the possibility of roaming staff to patrol parks as well as general review of staffing needs with a specific emphasis on trash and graffiti issues. This was a two-tiered proposal. The first tier was DPW focused and was approved at your July 21st meeting. The second part of this proposal is an expansion of part-time staffing at city parks. As you can see from our, our table here, uh, we're looking at increasing the hours of part-time help. Um, as requested, we looked at the uh, holiday hours. We looked at, at, at having availability and, and, and uh, double coverage in some cases at some of our parks where if somebody does come up to Hess, there will be somebody at the counter or there will be somebody there to, to assist them. Um, in some cases, we, we do not have staff parks, such as Eastview, which we would look to increase part-time staffing hours there altogether. Uh, that would be a, uh, one of the more newer uh, uh, recommendations. Um, what this, without going into a lot of these details here in regards to the uh, amounts, uh, what it equals out to is about six, uh, six and three quarters of a part-time staff working a full 28 hours a week. Um, that's basically the equivalent of what we're requesting here. On top of that would be uh, additional startup supplies as, as mentioned in, the, uh, in, in more detail in the staff report. Again, looking at what the proposed staffing increase would impact, uh, obviously, we'd be increasing our staffing levels, uh, especially during our peak times. We'd be educating the park visitors, enforce park rules. In <coughs> essence, we'd be, we would have more presence. Uh, we'd have year-round staffing at Eastview Park. We'd, uh, again, by having uh, more presence, curbing vandalism, um, we'd look to have those gates open and those restrooms open during those holidays. And again, to supplement what you approved with DPW, we'd be able to uh, assist with DPW and uh, with the graffiti and the trash uh, in those parks. Um, we will also look to, for roaming staff for some of our unstaffed parks just to go over and take an eye. Um, it does, uh, I'd like to minimize the, the, the photos that I receive on Monday mornings of overflowing trash cans. So those kind of things that I'd really like to uh, minimize and having roving staff would uh, definitely assist in that manner. <clears throat> this concludes the report. If you have any questions, staff is available. Just have one question. Um, we had a discussion that uh, we could piggyback on a contract with Torrance in terms of some of this with a mobile app. I don't see that in the staff report. Uh, th that was in the, the <coughs> proposal that you approved two weeks ago for okay. Public Works with the uh, and the name of the company is Gra Graffiti Protective Coatings. Okay. We're in the process of preparing that contract and. And they're ready to, to get going as soon as we, we uh, get that executed. Okay, thank you. Question, uh, yes. Question. Do we know who uh, the school district uses for graffiti removal? Because one of the local middle schools, Ridgecrest, has been hit twice with big graffiti attacks in just the last week. And I noticed that both times they had a crew out there same day. I mean, with the, with the blasters. And I didn't know if they were doing that in-house or if they contracted out. But it, it was pretty impressive to see them out there within a couple of hours after, uh, after the police were there. 
Uh, I don't know. I don't know if Michael knows. Uh, it, it wouldn't be in-house. Probably it takes specialized equipment that can be expensive, and so they probably <coughs> called someone very quickly, and they, they got up there. Because, again, almost any every urban city in Southern California has a contractor on call or um, either there in the city eight hours a day. Uh, and so then, uh, again, and that's something we can check to see who they used and how they liked the service. Yes. If that doesn't do it, there's uh, this. Thank you. Okay. Maybe we should have some water, Mr. Mayor. Yeah. I, I did. But he is, <laughs> but he's <laughs> losing his. Okay. Uh, I have a question. You know, this, um, you know, I don't have a concern about hiring staff to do these things, but I do, I am concerned about how we're going to pay for this. Um, according to the uh, staff report, page six, um, maybe the director of finance can tell us what we, uh, staff is recommending uh, precisely in this, that we're going to be pulling from reserves to fund this? No. We currently have an excess fund balance reserve of approximately a million dollars, and we um, recommend using the fund balance reserve until we come back at mid-year, and then look at maybe um, reapportioning the budget to. I guess, I guess I'm just, um, the semantics bother me. Mm -hmm. Whenever we say we're gonna pull from reserves, I just go negative right mm -hmm. away. I do not. <clears throat> under any circumstance want to pull reserves for operating expenses so of the city but let me let me finish maybe we could say this is a million dollar surplus that a that's surplus. exactly what it is it's a million dollar surplus then, okay then i'm more comfortable with that okay. but i mean the way it was written i just naturally would vote mind? against this just okay. because it says it's coming from reserves i will never vote for normal operating expenses being I totally understand. For emergency, that's what you pull for reserves for. Yes. Okay. Jim. Well, if I could clarify as that word, and just so that we're clear what we meant by that. So you have a general fund reserve, which is set at 50%. But this is not pulling from that. You have money that the council transferred to the CIP, this doesn't pull from that. What the council did leave in the budget was a million dollar, you c we can call it a surplus, but as far as this year's budget, it's an excess reserve. So it's the same thing, but it was over and above. Um, if you recall, we left that in the budget based on some, some possible anticipated expenses. So what we're proposing is that this come from that surplus. And that's why it's technical language. Okay, that's a surplus. <laughs> yeah, and I, I, I agree with that also because, I mean, we've had the last two years, we've had 15, 16 million dollars worth of surpluses. Now, all of, million. no, million. We've had 16 million dollars worth, worth of surpluses in just the last two years. Now, all of that gets swept into these various funds. And so when we pull it out, it does make me nervous also when I see we're pulling from the reserves. Well. The CIP reserve fund, for example, is probably 500% overfunded right now. So I'd prefer we talk about we're paying for this out of our surpluses uh, because I think that's a lot easier to understand from the public's perspective how we're paying for it. Another technical term for it is excess fund balance. <coughs> but it's just, we'll, we'll call it a surplus and, and that, that's where it's coming from. I like that title, excess fund balance. <laughs> I mean, we have the money, and clearly we did say when we were faced with all these problems that uh, we wanted to look at what we were going to do with regard to this increasing problem at all these parks. So I want to commend staff for coming forth with this report. You know, it's, um, it's the price we're paying, again, for being a destination city, and uh, we are a destination. Actually, for the world, we've become a destination location within probably five or six years. It's happened in a very short period of time. So um, I just had a couple of questions about some of these changes. 
um, an abalone, abalone cove. The, um, on page three, um, one of the problems um, people have been complaining to me about is that they can't even get in if they want to go watch the sunset. They can't go to park because the gates are closed at four o'clock. Or if they want to go in at that time, is there, even if we add this $32,000 um, in increasing 42 hours, um, the parking lot is still gonna close at four o'clock? Uh, incorrect. We would be open to, to, to uh, uh, sunset hours um, and probably beyond that as well to make sure but that... Uh, but the gate and the people at exactly. the parking structure are gone at 4, correct? They will not be. If this is approved, we will have the excess staff to, to uh, increase that. closes around... So to, what Corey's saying is if this is approved, we'll, okay. have the, we'll have the staffing to stay open to sunset and beyond to make sure it gets cleared out. So right right now, we just have enough staffing to be there till 4 o'clock. Okay. Uh, the roaming staffing, uh, I like the, the concept of that. It, it, it would be good if, um, you know, we had a lot of concerned citizens taking these pictures. I think that was a good concept. Uh, Eastview Park, I can say firsthand, I, I live on the east side of the hill. I go down there, and I was there for the recent uh, evening movie they had, the Paddington movie my grandson and I could see that and and from the complaints that do come in numerous complaints have been coming in over the years it's kind of like the rejected neglected area and it really does need to have somebody there because a lot of activity takes place a lot of trash builds up a vandalism there have been really surreptitious things happening in that parking lot and you can really easily see how it's right off the street, but it's covered by trees in that parking lot. So I can see that that particular area to staff that is going to make a big difference, and I think the community will really appreciate it. Looking at Hess Park, now you're, all, you're talking about here um, one additional staff rec person. And I did mention, you know, that when I was here on a Sunday, um, there was one staff person here, and then I guess he was gone for an hour or more, but this entire building, I mean, this is probably the one building next to City Hall that houses the most valuable equipment, and, and I mean, I don't know if anybody can argue with that, but there was nobody in here, and I was looking all around. I was showing them the room and the changes we made, and I was just really, I, I, so I really, if this is meant to make sure that this location that, that this building is going to be covered, so there will always be somebody inside here, because people were wandering in and out to go to the bathroom all the time. So I, I think these are reasonable. Ladera Linda, we know from the residents there that they complain about this regularly, the, the problems that they're having with, um, well, they have a variety of issues. Of course, the school district owns part of that you know, that soccer field and that whole area with the, I guess we're managing the gate, correct? Correct. Right. And uh, Ryan Park, of course, which is the original Rancho Palos Verdes Park, is probably the most popular park. Um, and so I think increasing those hours is good. I'm, I'm just concerned about one thing, you know, as we, as we look forward to where, what's going to happen to Rancho Palos Verdes, and we see we're becoming a destination city. I guess my one question would be, are we making more and more instead of less more? And I'm asking this question almost facetiously because I know that we have to do it. I mean, it's, we're going to have to do more in order to make sure we take care of our facilities because of the increased problems. But as we go forward looking into all the um, passive park um, additions, you know, um, improvements we're going to be making in the future, uh, I think we just have to bear that in mind as we make these changes that our goal here is really less is more. But, uh, but I think this is a good, these are good suggestions and I don't have, I don't have a problem with these. So we have a couple speakers. Yes, we do. Mr. Oh, I'm Mayor. sorry. That's okay. 
I thought we did not. I see we do. <laughs> Our first speaker is Barbara Ayler. Welcome, Barbara. Thanks for waiting. For Thank so you, long. Barbara. I'm yeah, sorry. Yeah, for, thanks for waiting so long. I did not realize you were My speaking. pleasure. Um, Mayor Knight and Mayor Pro Tem Brooks and council members. Uh, first, I want to tell you I'm going to read this, so I'm, I have to apologize, but I'm tired, and I want to make sure I get it within the, the three minutes. So thank you very much for your time and effort to address the community's concerns about trash, graffiti, crime, safety, and vandalism at city parks and open space areas. As you know, the volunteer trail watch volunteers are seeing the same type of, of vandalism on the PV Nature Preserve as is happening on, say, Abalone Cove. Things like graffiti, removal of signs, removal of post and cable fences, and destruction of habitat are common. The Conservancy has a full-time employee that works very hard to close off unauthorized trails, but these efforts are repeatedly thwarted. In fact, the volunteers in the Keeper Program and the Volunteer Trail Watch uh, volunteers continually try to reclose trail spurs, and that's me, um, and areas closed for restoration. And the volunteer trail crew works to repair trails, and we all pick up trash and, and try to report the graffiti, because we know that the police are interested in that. We're finding it difficult to get the attention of perpetrators of such vandalism, and the Conservancy feels the financial pain of redoing and redoing our efforts. I believe you will likely have the same problem with an education-only uh, approach. Um, I have found that some organizations managing large preserves near large po population centers also have education programs, but supplement that with enforcement. For example, they coordinate with the local police who use hidden cameras, work during hours when the vandalism is most likely to occur, which is at night, and have periodic random high intensity enforcement exercises for a week or month at a time. Mm -hmm. Um, and I remember uh, Dave Rosas uh, mentioned that a couple of times, and I did talk to uh, Captain Bolin. Since the Conservancy does not have the authority to conduct enforcement, uh, you may consider doing something similar for the city parks, and we certainly need this type of enforcement on the preserve. The challenge of educating hundreds, really hundreds of visitors on a Saturday or even coaxing small groups can make some degree of, of help, but true success in managing and protecting our open spaces and parks depends on effective enforcement. And until enforcement takes a stronger role, more money spent on staffing may not be the whole solution to our problem. Very good. That's perfect. <clears throat> uh, Barbara, you've, had, you've sent emails to the council and some of the issues, and you raised some good good concerns. I would just recommend, since council is going to be, or the staff's going to be right. kind of looking at uh, some of the relationship preserve and so on, just be in contact with staff and share, you know, any insight you have, because you're part of that volunteer patrol. Mm -hmm. and so oh, on. I have to say, we're meeting uh, on a monthly basis with Matt and uh, Dave Pierce. It's just a pleasure. And um, I think we're making a, a lot of headway in okay. trying to come up with solutions. Okay. Thank well, you. Thank you so much, Barbara. Sure. Thank you. Yeah, uh, Councilman Campbell. Barbara. Barbara, I'm sorry. Quick, uh, Campbell has quick a question. question. When you see the vandalism, the graffiti, et, et, et cetera, who does that get reported to? Do you report it directly to the Sheriff's Department or do you report it to the city? Because we're not seeing it in the crime statistics. Well, I'm going to let Andrea answer the um, graffiti because the volunteer trail watch people, the keepers, and even the trail crew, they do report the graffiti. Um, and that goes into the web portal, the, especially the volunteer trail watch. All that data goes right into the web portal. And then every week uh, that is summarized and sent to Danielle 
uh, who was the steward director, and she um, and we have the, we include pictures and summarize what they've seen in that week. And from what I understand, and Andrea can clarify this, the graffiti is sent to the police department because they're very interested in trying to um, track different groups that might be causing this. Okay. And, he, and that's done weekly? Weekly, yeah. It's a lot of work. I'll bet. And now Eva Sequoia is in Norway, and I'm stuck doing it. <laughs> <laughs> I'll bet. What, what, do you, what do you think about uh, in, empowering you know, residents with some of these new apps where they can actually help track this graffiti? And, and, and I don't know how we set it up. Maybe they, maybe they have a link uh, uh, you know, to the Land Conservancy. Since you're gathering all of this data anyway, it would better allow you to track what's going on. Is that something that, that you think might, might be helpful? Uh, it would be. It would have to be consistent as we are consistent um, in documenting that. The keepers, for example, go over the same trails once a month. So it's very easy for them to see differences immediately and report that. Um, because our pictures are available, we know right where the graffiti is, and we describe that in the note. So um, don't want to have too much information coming in that might just confuse things. Right. Okay. D Thank duplicate you, data, in other words. Thank you. Welcome. Next speaker. Andrea Vona. Welcome, Andrea. Thank you. Um, hi, Andrea. Hi. Oh, hi, Susan. I wasn't. Um, <laughs> good evening. I'm sorry. I'm tired as well. Um, so I had sent a letter in this morning, and I won't read or reiterate the letter, but just, and I understand that the Palos Verdes Nature Preserve isn't specifically on the agenda tonight, but I, want, I do want to thank you all for your time and attention to the parks and to the open space um, and looking at some of these maintenance issues and concerns. It is really important. Um, um, so it's given that this is the Palos Verdes Nature Preserve is coming forward at a future council meeting, I did want to say that we're available to help clarify if there's anything that's not clear, and we'll continue to work with staff. The um, main gist of the letter that I submitted was certainly to advocate and to support for staffing um, considerations for the Palos Verdes Nature Preserve, similar to those being considered this evening for the parks. Um, as Barb mentioned, we are seeing things that would parallel, that are being observed in the parks are also being seen in the preserve, so there's not really a difference there. And the tasks that are being identified as what the staff, additional staff would do, are things that um, certainly the preserve could very much benefit from as well. Um, additional enforcement of the rules, educating visitors, additional attention to trash and graffiti and the like. Um, and I'm very interested in clarifying any roles or responsibilities if any of that's unclear as we move forward. And um, yeah, so I mean at this, I mean I just wanted to say that briefly since it feels odd commenting on something that's not technically on the agenda. So, so uh, you're still working close with staff in terms of your relationship and what your responsibilities are with, with the city's responsibility. You're still working closely with the city. Yes, we're still working closely, and I think, um, Mayor Knight, you summarized it um, accurately to say that the Conservancy is the habitat manager, and we are providing um, services. There is a fee coming from the city to the Conservancy. It covers about 30% of what those services cost, and the services are the city's obligation under the NCCP plan. So it's it's um, there's lots of moving parts within those relationships, but it is a defined scope of services as habitat manager that has various components. Um, and then there's various components that the city's responsible for, like sanitation control, you know, waste removal, the safety security, things like that. Um, and then, of course, there's also the conservation easements, which are separate but related. So, right. Did you have a question? Yeah, Councilman Campbell. Yeah, Andrea, what's your sense, uh, because you're out there every day, what's your sense of how much of the additional traffic to the preserve it are organized tours or or groups. I know the Santa Monica hiking group is you know goes down there frequently, but I've been seeing pictures of buses, for example, and and minivans which look like organized groups. And I and I 
wondered if is is Terranea does Terranea do tours of of it? I mean, what's your sense? Um, it's hard for me to pinpoint an exact percentage, but I do. I have seen um, an increase from things. You know, there's the Meetup dot com meetup groups, informal meetup groups, and organized groups. Um, I've been out and seen field trips um, out there. And, you know, we may or may not know about them, or the city may or may not know about them if they just walk onto the preserve. So, um, yeah, it's hard for me to say what percentage that is, but what it can mean is that you've got a really large group of people coming in at one time, where, you know, maybe just someone discovering it for the first time as, is a party of one versus a party of 75. Yeah. It can make a difference, certainly, I'm sure, with trash cans and everything else, the impact that that has. And especially if those visitors aren't aware of all of the rules and regulations and if it's their first time. It's a big, it can be a steep learning curve, but a really important one. Okay. All right, thanks. I mean, I mean, it's just astounding. I mean, just three years ago, maybe four years ago, you could walk down Burma Road on the weekend and maybe pass a couple of people. Mm -hmm. And now it's a hundred. Yeah, I mean, it, lot, it's yeah. just amazing to me how it's just exploded uh, uh, down there. I think social media is partially responsible for that. Yeah. Yeah, social media and, and well, yeah, that's, that's, mm -hmm. that's I mean, what I, it is. I'm, yeah, I'm just I wondering how many- I saw a natural old... disasters field trip went from um, Mount Sac out there one day. I mean, it's, yeah. Grant, the professor, I asked him, well, what is your course? Oh, natural disasters. We're, we're here to look at the landslide. And, <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, I mean, it's it's hard to, I, but anyway, so. Okay. There's all sorts of different groups yeah. out, I okay. think, as all well. Okay, right, thanks. Thanks, Andrea. Yeah. I got a question of Stout. Thank you, Andrea. Thank you. Yeah. On um, Ladera Linda, some of the property up there is school property, and they contract out with AYSO. Now, I know, um, I hope we're in discussion with them in terms of controlling some of the traffic because that's an issue with local residents. But are we, <clears throat> are we picking up some of the trash collection and, and, and vandalism from, from those activities? I mean, are, are we separating that out, or are we having a discussion with the school district if that's partly their problem? How's staff looked into this or approaching this? Uh, I think there, if there's bleed over as far as if, if there's something that needs to be uh, addressed um, and if it's anywhere near the fringe and, and, and Michael can jump in on this as well from a road standpoint, but we're going to we'll, we'll take care of it. We'll make sure that it gets uh, repaired. Um, but it, it, if it becomes a growing concern in some of those areas where we know it's coming from uh, uh, that particular use, then we'll, we can address that with, uh, uh, with the school district. However, we haven't had anything that's other than. Uh, uh, we don't have a whole lot of facts of, as to where it's being generated or from whom. Mm -hmm. Yes. If I can add one thing, I did um, speak to the superintendent of the school system some months back regarding trash complaints that we had. They spoke to their tenant, AYSO Soccer, and I was told that soon thereafter that the, the pickup from their large games and so on, tournaments and whatnot, that the trash pickup improved a great deal. And as Corey's saying, we haven't received any complaints. I am waiting to hear back from them on a solution that they're trying to work with AYSO Soccer on regarding traffic okay. on, uh, on busy weekends and tournaments and so on, that the school district has made a request of AYSO to staff um, traffic control at that intersection, and I haven't heard back, but I'll be following okay. up with that. Well, I just want to make sure we um, monitor that, and not we're not picking up, uh, we're not paying for a lot of right. stuff that's a result of school activity or something. So, just keep an eye on that and keep track of that, and just you know. right. Okay. Any other questions or comments? A motion. Yeah. I'll move approval, Mayor, of this. Uh, <clears throat> Of the staff recommendation on this um, enhancing park operations and maintenance. And this this is coming from excess surplus funds. Is that? Uh... No, it's coming oh, from. Are, don't I, do that. Don't do that. Okay. <laughs> All right. It's coming from excess fund balance. I will leave that alone. <clears throat> I wrote it down. Okay. <laughs> so you you're recommending staff uh, staff uh, recommendations? I mean, you're approving, uh, making a motion for staff yes. recommendations. Okay. If the motion includes the word. It's coming from surplus. Certainly. Oh, okay. Okay. Second. <laughs> All right. We have a motion, a second. Any more discussion? We'll have a vote, please. 
Councilman Campbell? Yes. Councilman Misitich? Yes. Mayor Pertem Brooks? Yes. And Mayor Knight? Yes. Motion passes. Our next item then is future agenda items. Do we have any future agenda items? No. Do we have a number seven? No. 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 I do. You do? Oh, it's from June 16th. How did we get that? Ah. Uh. Oh, they kept it in your book the, because that uh, was your... Uh, okay, all right. Okay, no, I didn't get that. So that means I'm still getting <clears throat> the same lousy binder. That's why it just... I, I have a uh, future agenda item, and it's not necessarily something we need to approve. Binder. It's no. it's a update status I want to give the council on what's called a CCA. It's community... Uh, uh, it's, 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 it has to do with um, community choice aggregation, something I've been following through the South Bay Cog and some other organizations for a while, <clears throat> there's an opportunity we're going to have to provide our, our uh, residents with a selection of energy sources for on Southern California Edison bills and a possibility to lower their, their bills as a result, and also a uh, possibility of providing more incentive programs that would br broaden people's ability to even save energy further. So I'm just going to put together a, a status report and just bring that forth for your for your perusal, um, kind of a file, uh, receive and file type thing. So I'll bring that forward to council. Yeah. I've got uh, two items. Uh, number one, we've been involved in on and off negotiations with our local employee union for, for quite some time, and I have been getting some questions from the public as to what the status is of that. So if it's possible, if we could give a, a you know, a broad overview of just, of just where we are without delving into the details of the actual negotiations, I'd like to be able to explore that just to keep the public uh, up to speed. Second item is I've also been getting a fair number of questions regarding why we don't have the storm drain user fee extension or not on this November's election. <laughs> and there's a reason for that, because the ballot doesn't go out to every single resident out there that can, uh, that can vote. So there's a reason to keep it separate. However, the average resident in RPV doesn't see those distinctions. And since it is sunsetting, and since we are planning for a March mail-in election, uh, I think it would be a good idea for us during this election year for the people to hear from their elected representatives as to uh, what they think about the validity of extending that or not. And if we are going to put it on the March election, then let's have that discussion now and decide on ballot language. Is that a future agenda item? Yeah. Okay. Well, it's going to be a future agenda item anyway. Let's have it now. Okay. All right. Any other future agenda items? Yeah. So okay. uh, yes. I, I will say that item, and I'm sorry I don't have it with me. It is scheduled on a future agenda for the council right. to decide if yes. you want to have a if you want to have a mail-in ballot in March. I don't have the date with me, but it's sometime this fall, and so mm -hmm. I'll have to get that date and make it's sure. That okay. Council, oh, okay. There's it's no not, exact date. It's not, a, it's not an election date. It's, a, uh, it's mail ballot. I, I know. I thought we it's had it on a, a future agenda I think for we the do. council. Well, we, we, we have to because we, we have to decide on what the actual ballot yeah. language is going to be it and, is on a and, and, and whether to even put it out there. I mean, the, right. the council has to call an election on it. Right. So my point being is that we only get an opportunity to elect our representatives every four years or every two years there's an election because we, we uh, alternate it. And I've gotten a lot of questions from the public about uh, about having that done before the November election. They'd like to hear from their elected representatives as to what they think and feel uh, is the appropriate thing to do as to whether to extend this tax or not. Well, I think we do have it on the agenda sometime this At fall. At some yeah. point. It's so cool. I'll definitely look and get back to the council okay. on that. Okay. Next item. <clears throat> City Council oral reports. Uh, Councilman Campbell, and start over there. I will submit anything I miss in writing. Uh, the one main item is I uh, was uh, happy to go and speak at the uh, at the Marymount event where they were welcoming in the two new co-presidents, 
and, um, uh, and saying farewell to their president of the last nine years, uh, Dr. Michael Brophy. So uh, it was a very nice event. There was uh, several hundred people there probably, and he has uh, accepted a, a, a position as president of another Catholic university quite a bit larger than Marymount back in Chicago. I think he's from that general part of the country. And, um, uh, and it, was, it was nice to see it. I mean, I actually know his wife more than I know him because she used to teach Sunday school up at St. John uh, uh, Fisher, and, and she was uh, an instructor for my, my youngest son. And he, uh, uh, what amazes me, I mean, I was brought up Catholic, but what amazes me is that he actually likes religious education. I mean, when I was brought up and my parents forced me to, I mean, encouraged me to go to, uh, to that sort of thing on, on Sunday, it wasn't nearly as fun. So I, I credit Tara Brophy, she's a wonderful person, uh, with, uh, with doing a great job with, uh, with a lot of the little kids in our neighbor, uh, in our community. Okay, thank you. Mayor Pro Tem? Uh, yes, thank you. Um, so on the 26th, I attended the ETC fundraiser at the Vanderlips, and you were there too, Mr. Mayor, and that was quite an exciting uh, educational experience. Uh, a lot of young people um, in a nonprofit group working for the betterment in theater arts. On the 27th, I attended the recognition wall meeting with staff. Mr. Campbell could not attend, was unable to. Um, and at that point, with, Pet, with Carolyn Petru and Diana Resnick and Scott, the designer, um, we looked at a selection of design materials and an earthen movement for this wall. So he's moving forward with a concept um, with a particular type of material, which is almost like um, DG, uh, but not because it's 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 a cement wall but it, it is a more uh, slightly textured surface and this is i think we're very fortunate to have a very very talented designer who's working with us on this on the 30th of um july i went with um two residents to the torrance airport where we had a tour of the Torrance Airport. There's been a lot of discussion about aircraft, noise, ultralights, all sorts of things. So we had a fantastic tour. Um, we even went into the control tower and were able to, of course it paled in comparison to your and my experience, Mr. Mayor, of three years ago when we went to- Central Tra control, Yeah, Tracor, Tracor, Tracon. Trickers. Down in San Diego, which right. runs all of Los Angeles out of San Diego. And that was awesome. But this was really good because we had a tour also of the entire airport. And um, well, I was able to find one of the um, uh, light aircraft locations, um, and I spoke with them. Uh, they did let me know that they are not the ones who are flying the ultralight that is apparently creating havoc with some of the residents uh, along the bluff, in particular, where it's flying at the very same height and eye level at the property line uh, along Ocean Terraces, Marguerite Drive, uh, Sea Bluff. Um, so it is an issue, and I did contact Hawthorne Airport today, and so we're working together with some residents, and they're, they're identifying times and dates. So we may not need to have any kind of ordinance for something like this. We're trying to see if we can mediate and discuss, um, because they're obviously not following the rules. The rules are 1,000 up and 2,000 out, so feet. So you, you know, they're, this is not being um, followed. And so they're very concerned, and they're very good <clears throat> about noise. They track everything. So on the 31st, I attended the fish luncheon at Dalmatian Hall, and um, city manager was my guest, along with another resident. And uh, on the, the first, I attended the San Taste of San Pedro and actually hosted a booth there. And it was well attended. This is the first time they've actually gone through it on a contained environment. I have to mm -hmm. say it was so successful that I'm so thrilled for the people of San Pedro that they could really have um, an event with fantastic, and it was right at the crafted facility, 
So there's arts and crafts inside, and there's this wonderful environment outside. So it's a good thing for our sister city. On um, the second, I attended um, the Mira Catalina Barbecue for their annual homeowners, gave an update on city activities. A lot of involvement in the community, very involved community. Um, and then um, yesterday, I attended a fundraiser for the Assembly District 66 over at Rock and Brews, and um, it was a really action-packed event with uh, Assemblyman Hadley at the helm. And that is my report, Mr. Mayor. Hey, thank you. Thank you. Council Mr. Titch. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, on the 15th of July, I attended the California JPIA uh, regular Good. board of directors meeting. Some of the things that the JPIA announced that they're working on um, this year for, for cities is to help cities become more ADA compliant. They offer, they're offering consulting. Uh, they're focusing a lot on repair of sidewalks, <coughs> trip and fall accidents. That is a huge um, claim uh, that is uh, JPI, JPIA is receiving from cities. And so they're working with various cities on um, how to repair sidewalks and replace pieces of sidewalks. Uh, they use, uh, they are recommending more of a, uh, cutting and slicing ra rather than the other methods to do uh, sidewalk repair. And so mm. um, it, it's more cost effective and, and they feel that it's uh, uh, helping out more avoid uh, trip and fall accidents. Uh, they are also uh, offering risk uh, management uh, technical support <laughs> and uh, they are now creating a captive insurance company for some of the cities that would like to use a captive insurance company. So um, it was a good meeting and uh, uh, was glad to be there. The, on the 31st, I attended the Dalmatian American Club Fish Luncheon and uh, former Mayor Frank Scotto was my guest from Torrance. Jim. Yes. Um, in your comments, could you remind everyone that tomorrow's the cutoff date for the UUT uh, rebate program? I think they've got through close of business on August 5th, or is it, or is it midnight tonight? I'm sorry, I don't remember that date off the top of my head. Let me try to look real quickly. In, in any case, if, okay. it's, if it's not midnight tonight, it's okay. tomorrow. And so if anybody's and watching Does TV, any other staff member know that date? or? <clears throat> Okay, we'll look it up and then we'll, I'll make an announcement for it. Thank you. Um, July 22nd, I went to a special meeting at the Cal Water with the city manager. Uh, update on the conservation mandates that they have and what they're doing um, in terms of their own conservation measures. And gave, they gave us a report, detailed report of each city, how we're doing on the hill here in terms of the conservation. As I mentioned earlier, um, even though we didn't meet the 36%, we were right around 35%. So... Uh, kudos to the RPV residents uh, f for doing a, a conservation that far exceeds a lot of the other cities around, around the, the, uh, the South Bay area. Um, July 23rd, I had a South Bay COG board meeting. <clears throat> we had a presentation by Howard Choi, who is the sustainable division of uh, L.A. County. And uh, <clears throat> L.A. County is embarking on a feasibility study for the cities for this uh, community uh, choice aggregate I was talking about earlier. And um, I think there's some promising things about it that uh, could be very helpful to our residents. So I'm keeping track of that. Um, July 25th, I went on a sanitation boat trip to their outfall area. And it was very interesting. And they, they, they go down and they take, bring up what they find at the bottom of the, of the uh, particular areas where they bring the cages up. And it's fascinating what they find down there, what they have down there. But they also have a presentation of what the sanitation district's done over the years, and it's it's really uh, it's tremendous improvement from when they first did it back in the 60s and the 70s and so on. So to let the residents know, uh, even though the the treated sewage is going out there, it's 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 um, it's uh, rather clean when they finally let it out of uh, the, the outfall at the uh, Great area. July 29th, <coughs> I was invited by uh, something called. Uh, 
Verde Exchange, uh, Jeremy Davies in my neighborhood, to go to the LA Department of LA Division of Economic uh, Corporation. And Felicia Marcus was on the, the State Water Resources Board was there. And she also discussing some of the water issues we're facing and how the state is uh, trying to address it on a regional, larger statewide basis. I had an opportunity to su uh, submit a paper I have on what I call water neutral development I'm developing for, for possible legislation. So I, I presented that to her and she's gonna get back to me on her staff on that. Uh, July 31st, uh, the mayor's breakfast, uh, Jerry was there and we had a healthy discussion of city issues and our committees and commissions and um, the conversations are very interesting and they're very informative and I think they're very helpful for the committees to understand the other committees and what their issues are and for us to get the feedback from them as well. There's a wonderful uh, coordination going on between the IMAC and the FAC committee in terms of finances versus yeah. projects and it's a very interesting um, uh, feedback they're getting. I think that's gonna be very productive for the city council down the road. And today I went on an LAX tour with the city manager. Oh, that's a great one. And um, finally, uh, South Bay Cog tour. It was it was through the South Bay through Cog, but the city Jackie. manager, I guess, was invited. Uh, I guess through the South Bay Cog as well. Yeah, you I went. Yeah, and right. You went into the Bradley Terminal. Yes, that right. That was great. I yeah. Did that last year. And what's really nice, just to let the residents know, the LAX has finally come to terms with Metro. <clears throat> they finally have a plan that's going to connect the Crenshaw that's extension good. on Metro all the way into the terminals of LAX. And this has been an issue that's uh, been at odds for, for years, and there's finally a final plan that's going to be for that. It's, it's a long project. They're talking about completing it in 2023. Uh, it's going to be kind of a, a mess con constructing in the meantime. But I think they're talking about starting construction somewhere in 2017. But um, it's going to be a tremendous improvement to the airport that's been long, long overdue. So that's all I have. Um, I guess we're at a point where we have a closed session report. Um, yes, and just for clarification on the question about the UUT, the deadline is August 5th. Staff oh, found that. Business, uh, close the business yes, August 5th? That would be okay, so people have got through tomorrow to do it. And I, I just did it online, August. and it, it is very quick. It's very efficient. Mm -hmm. okay. And I didn't take the automatic $25. I actually uploaded a couple of bills, but it's simple and easy. Okay. So just so the public knows, uh, August 5th. Tomorrow. At 5, is that the close of business day? 5.30. 5.30 close business. is the last to submit your uh, request for a refund for utilities tax on the telecommunications. Yeah. Right. Okay. Thank you. So our next item is closed session report. Yes, thank you. Um, I'll just start off by saying that um, fortunately we were able to connect with um, Councilman Dehovic, so he was present during throughout the entire closed session discussion. Um, with respect to item number one, which was the Meadowar case, um, unanimous direction was given to the city attorney's office to make a section 998 offer to the plaintiffs. That was 5-0 vote. Um, number two, which is potential litigation against the city, uh, three potential cases, a report was given, no action was taken. Uh, with respect to number three, which was regarding the Green Hills claims, uh, unanimous direction was given to council, again, all five council members present and voting unanimously to give that direction to legal counsel. Uh, and then item number four, which is the um, which was the Shabazian claim, a report was given, no action was taken. Thank you. Okay, and before we adjourn, I just want to clarify that uh, Councilman Dehovic was available to be part of the meeting. It wasn't that he wasn't available. We had technical difficulties, so he could not participate, but uh, I just want the record to re record that he was made himself available. So motion to adjourn. Move adjourn. Without objection, that'll be the order. Successor agency. Yep, go on to successor agency. Would you like me? Okay. Uh, roll call. Uh, Member Campbell. Here. Member Dehovit. Member Mizetich. Present. Vice Chair Brooks. Here. And Chair Knight. Here. And is Member Dehovic's absence excused? Is excused, right. right. Thank you. The next item is approval of agenda and consent calendar, if you so Mr. Please. Mayor, I will move approval of the agenda and the consent calendar. Second. Okay. 
On the vote. Member Misitich? Yes. Member Campbell? Yes. Vice Chair Brooks? Yes. And Chair Knight? Yes. Motion passes. The next item is Motion public comments. Uh, public not, comments. Not quite yet, sorry. Right. Uh, section of the agenda for audience comments for items not on the mm -hmm. agenda. We have no request to speak. And then it would be adjournment. And we are going to be adjourning this meeting to August 18th at 7 p.m. for an adjourned regular meeting of the successor agency. Okay. Motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Without objection, that will be the order. Our next meeting then is the Improvement Authority. I'll call the meeting to order. Thank you. Commissioner Campbell? Here. Commissioner Dehovit? I excuse absent. Thank you. Commissioner Mizitich? Present. Vice Chair Brooks? Here. And Chair Knight? Here. We have a quorum. Our next item is approval of the agenda and the consent calendar. I move approval of the agenda and the consent calendar. Second. Okay, we'll vote. Commissioner Mizitich? Yes. Commissioner Campbell? Yes. Vice Chair Brooks? Yes. And Chair Knight? Yes. The so next excused uh, absent. Yeah. Oh, yes. For Commissioner Dehovic, yes. Thank you. Public comments, and this is a section of the agenda for audience comments for items not on the agenda. I have no request to speak. And then our final item is adjournment. Move adjourn. That'll, without objection, that will be your, Yes, Councilman Campbell. I've got a quick question uh, for the Director of Finance. Move under adjourn. the... Uh, under the cash balances, we've got Bank of the West, well, State okay. of California, State of we, California. Hold on a second. Order. A little bit. We just adjourned, so we yes, need to reopen the meeting. Well, I'll reopen the meeting. I, I just have to officially do that, Brian, because we did adjourn. So oh, I'll, reo I'll reopen the meeting, so go forth. Yeah. I just had a quick question. I see these are all on-demand accounts, and the State of California actually pay a yield on that. Are, are those checking accounts or effectively checking accounts from the state of California? I'm not sure. I will look into it and get back to you. And that, because usually it's the other way around. It's usually the private sector. You'll get a little bit of a yield and then the, you know, the, the if it's a yield. type of a LAFE, uh, you know, state account, then, then you wouldn't. That just popped out. That's all. So you'll go get back to Point council on that and I will. clarify that. Okay. Yes, All right. Any other uh, questions or, or questions on the? Um, no. So I'll, I'll entertain adjourn a motion again. to adjourn. Yep. Move adjourn. Motion adjourn without objection. That'll be the order. Thank you. Well, before 10.